Well, good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 32nd meeting of 2017. We have no apologies. Agenda item number one is a decision on taking item three in private, which is consideration of the committee's approach to scrutiny of the draft 2018-19 Scottish Government budget. Are we all agreed to take this item in private? Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item two is our third day of taking evidence on the offensive behaviour at football and threatening communication repeal Scotland bill. And I refer members to paper one, which is a note by, a by the clerk, and paper two, which is a spice paper. Um, again, welcome James Kelly, the member in charge of the bill, to the committee meeting. I understand, James, you can only attend for the first panel um, and that Claire Beartwell will be attending later for the second. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I also welcome our first panel, Anthony Horan, Director of the Catholic Parliamentary Office Catholic Bishops Conference Scotland, Reverend Ian Galloway, Church of Scotland and Society Council, Chris Oswald, Head of Policy, Equality and Human Rights Commission, Euphram Broski, who has just joined us. Um, uh, yeah, we, we knew you'd been held up, so very good you've made it for the beginning, Euphram. Director of the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities and Debbie Figures, Development Assistant, Scottish Women's Convention. Can I thank the, the um, panellists for all your submissions, written submissions, have been extremely helpful to the committee. We'll now move straight to questions, and can I begin by asking the panel members, just in general terms, um, just how you, you feel about report, uh, the repeal. Are you supportive or you're not supportive? Do you have general concerns? And anyone that would like to start? Right, Mr. Horn. Thank you, convener. Um, I think, um, First and foremost, if I could just set out that uh, the, the Catholic Church would take the position that the decision on whether or not to repeal this act is, is, is something for Parliament. That's a decision for Parliament. But, uh, and when, when the act was first introduced in 2012, we, had, uh, we certainly were supportive of the, the broad principle, which is to tackle offensive behaviour. And, uh, and, and everything that, sort of goes, that goes along with that. Um, the church would always condemn um, any behaviour which uh, would uh, foster hatred of any any kind, um, but uh, and so in terms of the, the broad principle of the Act tackling offensive behaviour, we of course we would support that. But I think there, underneath that, there are questions around um, the the overall efficacy of the Act um, and also how it was introduced and brought into being. And I think there are questions around that. I'm not sure if you want me to, to tease those out just now or whether that will come out in, in, in the evidence, but I can, I can maybe just give if a, you give a broad areas, brush of then it. We yes. can, uh -huh. I think perhaps one of the... I, I, it does appear that um, when the bill was, was introduced that, that it was, it, it was fast-tracked somewhat and that it seemed to be rushed through and it wasn't perhaps given the, the proper scrutiny that, for example, the repeal bill is currently being given just now. Um, uh, there also remain questions around whether or not it was, up, it was actually necessary because there ha I know the committee has received the evidence or heard the evidence that uh, the, uh, there was pre-existing uh, legislation in common law which would have covered the offences which uh, are cited in the Act. So th that, in, in, in a broad sense, is, is the concerns that we would have. Thank you. Uh, anyone want to go next? Reverend Cranloway? I think that when the current act was being introduced, the, the Church of Scotland cautioned that it was um, important to see the impact of uh, that piece of legislation in the context of a, a wider view of how we are dealing with issues around sectarianism in our society. And it, I think it's to the government's credit that, that in these years since there has been considerable work being done on um, where we sit with these things. Um, and we recognise that sectarianism is still very much an issue um, and it shows up in lots of different places including at football. Um, we cautioned then about the, the speed of the legislation and we would caution now about the speed of repeal. 
um, on, in the sense that we note that sectarianism can be seen to be part of a weave of attitudes and behaviours um, which uh, relate also to other issues that we have in our society around racist attitudes and behaviours, um, other religious attitudes and behaviours, including Islamophobia and so on. And it, it does seem to us that given that there is a review, a wider review of hate crime being undertaken, that it would be wise to see society's response to sectarianism in the context of that wider review. And particularly for, I think, for young people who inherit our legislative decisions along with all the other decisions that we make, uh, sectarianism does not sit on its own as a, um, as a very separate thing from all of those other attitudes and behaviours that they have to encounter and decide about and respond to themselves. And I, th I think that overall weave is where we would like to see this matter resolved. And so we think it would be wise to not rush a question of repeal or amendment, but to, but to wait for that outcome and then see where, where the bits of this legislation sit in, in relation to that. And the, and the other thing is that sometimes, sometimes we, we can try to make a decision for one reason and send a message uh, that isn't the one that we're intending to send. And we think that there is a danger of sending a message by the simple repeal of this legislation um, to people that, that, we are, that we're not taking seriously enough the kinds of behaviours and attitudes that we find and that we're not taking seriously enough um, societies need to say these are unacceptable and that um, we would um, want to know very clearly what are the alternatives before we remove one or two of the safeguards that are in place through this legislation but it's largely it's a question of timing and um, and that wider review that we think in an overarching sense could include how we should yeah, respond to this particular issue. Okay, Thanks, thank you. Kevin. Chris Salter? Yes? Uh, yes, I very much agree with you, and I think that until the wider review has been progressed and its findings have been um, put out for discussion and debate, I think it would be unwise to proceed at this point with the repeal of the Act. Whilst the discussions around the Act predominantly um, are to do with sectarianism, we need to note that uh, protections around uh, for disabled people, for trans people, would also be lost with no, protect, with no prospect of reintroduction at this point. Um, the threatening religious communications aspect of the Act would also be lost, and again, with no prospect of them being reintroduced at this point. Um, whilst the Commission recognises that freedom of speech and freedom of expression are enormously important issues um, and protected by Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights. They need to be balanced against the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, um, which states that states need to protect or have laws in place which counter incitement to discrimination, to hostility and violence. And it's the Commission's position um, that the International Convention uh, overrides uh, the ECHR in this case. I would also stay, say that there are wider implications that this is not just about those people who want to gather at grounds and feel that they have um, their rights are being infringed by being unable to sing particular songs. I think it's about the broader base of fans, those people who wish to attend football matches but are put off from doing so because of the conduct of others. Okay, and Debbie Figgy. Hi, uh, I just want to start off by describing our organisation. We are uh, we're funded to consult with women across Scotland. We're not a lobbying organisation funded by the government. We hold roadshows and roundtable events, which can be very small and up to about 40, 50 at time, uh, women in a room, and we discuss what's happening in their local area, how they feel about things that are going on in their area, things that are going on in policy, and anything else they wish to discuss while they are there. We also hold thematic conference events, which don't tend to be around things that are happening locally, it tends to be around bills that are coming through in the Parliament. 
We have held a number of events from the top of Scotland down to the borders, and we also hold them in the islands as well. And women come along to our events to tell us what they feel and what their voices are. As a women's organisation, we welcome any moves, including this bill, if it offers protection for women where others don't. This bill does offer some extra protection for women around the equality aspect of it. We also have had, and I do have to mention, over the weekend, a campaign by a group of women who have wanted to get in touch with us. And I can't ignore their voices because we are about women's voices. And we've had 40 emails from women asking us to take back our evidence to this session. But we feel that all women's voices are very important. And women have come to our events and discussed this issue with us. And that's what appears in our evidence to the, the actual committee. Uh, women aren't protected by hate crime. Uh, it's not part of the hate crime legislation. And we feel breach of the peace for things like rape threats and sexual harassment when football games are on is unacceptable. So that's where we're coming from with our evidence to it. Thank, Thank you. And you're from Borowski. Thank you very much. And again, apologies for the state of the M8, <laughs> um, but you're not the transport committee. Um, I think really, in general, my position is almost identical with that of Ian Galloway. Uh, I would say that anybody who's old enough to remember the original um, Race Relations Act will realize how much has society has changed, that people do not say things now that they would have said in the 1960s, at least not in public. Um, and that is partly down to legislation. So I don't think we can underestimate the effect that legislation has on attitudes. And so that, I think, is, is one marker. And therefore, I'm predisposed towards anything that criminalizes hate crime because it ultimately will feed into society's attitudes. Um, I'm therefore predisposed against repealing any anti-hate crime legislation for exactly the same reason. As, as Ian Galloway says, it can inadvertently send the wrong messages uh, that somehow or other some kind of hate crime or some kind of speech or some kind of action is now acceptable in society at large. I was very taken, I must say, I haven't read all the submissions to this committee, but the ones I have read were what we might call the representative ones, and I wouldn't go so far as to say they were unanimous, but they were certainly nearly unanimous in their opposition to the repeal, largely for those kinds of reasons. So if all what we might call the victim groups are saying that they feel to any extent protected by this legislation, that itself is a reason for holding on to it. Um, the other thing is, again, as, as Ian and Chris both said, um, the original legislation was criticised for being piecemeal and hurried. And here we are talking about repealing it while there is a large-scale review of hate crime legislation going on at exactly this time. And I would have thought that whatever the deficiencies in the legislation as it currently stands may be, and that's not something I would pretend any expertise on, uh, but if people tell us that there are deficiencies in it, we have to listen to them. But we should be listening to them in the context of the Brackadale Review and not hurriedly and in a piecemeal manner repealing the existing legislation. And the other thing I would add is simply in terms of slightly more detail, and again this has been said by others, it's not only about football. And it's not only about sectarianism, and sectarianism is itself an iffy concept. It's not only about religious hatred. Um, we should, in fact, be thinking in terms of a wider hate crime legislation, maybe in this form, maybe in a different form. Uh, but it should cover all hate crime in all contexts equally and not simply single out, which is one of the criticisms of this legislation, one particular uh, group. 
just on, on the, the submissions that have been received from a variety of organisations. Yep. Now, I haven't done the count to see what a majority would look like, but certainly there have been strong views on both sides of the arguments. So I think, you know, it's, it's, it's fair to just put that up front just now. Well, the, the ones, with respect, the ones from the groups that are representative of the protected characteristics mm. were notably uh, against repeal. Yeah, yeah. Certainly the impression I had. Yeah. Well, that, that's good to put that in context, absolutely. Um, Rona. Yes, uh, thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, can I ask you what... Sorry. Yeah. Can I ask you what... Um, if you feel that the Act has led to a change in behaviour at football matches, and if you do feel that, and you feel it, if you feel it's for the better, has it led to your enjoyment of football matches more, if any of you attend football matches? Anybody? Peter, uh, start on yes, that one sure. by telling you that the last time I attended a football match, I was aged about 13. <laughs> um, so I simply can't uh -huh. respond to that. Okay. Personally, David, I don't no. attend football matches at <coughs> all, and I've, I've got no okay. really okay. strong interest in football yeah. either. Okay. So. Chris? Um, I, I was struck um, reading the uh, Glasgow Evening Times last week that there was a report of fans being sought after sectarian and homophobic chanting on a train on a, uh, between Edinburgh and Glasgow, I think it was, uh, in advance of a match. So no, when it hasn't had the fully intended um, uh, impact that it had, it's still a relatively new piece of legislation, um, I would say. Uh, as to whether or not uh, it has changed behaviour at football grounds, I think it's very hard to say. I mean, I, I think there will be situations where uh, people's behaviour may be constrained by knowledge that the Act is in force. There will be situations where people simply don't care uh, about those constraints. I'm not quite sure how you could measure um, that. But I think, uh, as already been said, there's a, uh, it, there's a very strong symbolic element to it. Um, that the Scottish state is saying that they do not believe that this behaviour is acceptable. And I think that has been communicated quite successfully and will have had some impact on some fans. Thank you. R Reverend Gallery. I've led a very sheltered life, but, uh, but I have been to quite a lot of football matches. And as a young person, I used to go all the time. And some of the most scary events of my life in terms of feeling under personal threat happened in those context, including um, being subjected to violence and abuse. Um, I was uh, privileged to be on the advisory group on tackling sectarianism that the government set up. And, and in the course of that work, I attended a number of football contexts in association with the police operations that were happening in order to be able to just get a sense of the issues that were involved and how they are working out. Now, I, I would not say that anything had got worse than I remembered uh, from before, but I wouldn't be able to say with any confidence that things had got markedly better. I, th I think that um, when, when you go to an event where you find um, aggressive hostility being expressed between groups of people, and when you go to events at which there is deliberate physical damage being done to property, as a matter of course, and as a matter of what is a normal expectation, um, then you have to say things are not very good. That's not great. And um, I know people who, have, who, who were experiencing those things for the first time and then became horrified that their children attended these kind of events. I, th I, th I think it's easy for us to normalise in the context of football behaviour which should not be normalised and should not be acceptable. Mm -hmm. And I do know of a number of people who are what I would call middle class people with significant responsibilities who when they attend these events their behaviour is unlike at any other point in their life, I hope, I mean, I don't know what they do behind the closed doors of their homes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I worry about that. But if it's anything like the behaviour that they exhibit in these contexts, then it's very concerning. And it's one of the few contexts that we have in our society at which people do that and think it's okay, that it's normal. Mm 
And actually, it's not normal. And we should not be accepting that it's normal. I don't think that has improved dramatically. I think there will be some people who will be aware that they're more under scrutiny and are <clears throat> more liable to a response than, than they were before this legislation. I don't think the legislation's a panacea, by the way. I don't, you know, I'm not here to hold a candle for it. But I am here to say that we cannot accept the behaviour that we get in the context of football any, any more than we would anywhere else. And that we need to look for leadership in that. And I don't see the leadership that we need coming from, for example, the football industry. I just don't see it. Therefore, I think that it's important that government does take a lead on our behalf and encourages us all to take a lead in saying this is unacceptable and we won't put up with it. Thank you. Anthony? I, uh, I, did, I used to attend uh, football uh, matches regularly, but uh, I now have a very young family and uh, it's somewhat put paid to my attendance at games. But I do still go to the odd one. And my experience is, um, I think it's similar to what, to what Reverend Galloway was saying. I, it's, it doesn't appear to have got any worse, but I don't think it, you know, I don't think it's got any better either. It's very, but as, as Chris Oswald said, it's very, very hard to measure um, and hard to gauge. But uh, I don't, I don't see any sort of improvement um, in terms of, of behaviour at football matches. It seems to be, it, it, it hasn't changed okay, dramatically. Debbie, can I just ask you, um, I appreciate you, you say you're not a football, football fan, but from the forums, the women's forums that you, you, you hold, um, and you know, from your previous submissions, etc., can you give us a flavour of how you feel this legislation, does it make you feel safer? Is it, does it help on your way to, you're travelling to matches? And is that why you, you don't want to see this bill? Well, women that have come to our events, and I emphasise that point because we can only take the voices of the women that attend our sure. events, which are in their hundreds. It's, it's not a small organisation. We are a very small organisation, but we do cover Scotland widespread. They have felt increasingly <coughs> terrified and scared about particularly public transport and public places like pubs when football games are on. Uh, they've given us evidence on that, and our evidence does contain the quotes directly from women. But we actually did do a round tables with young women, and it extends to so much as school uniform and them feeling that they can't wear their own school tie because they're subjected to abuse from what school they go to. Mm -hmm. And we find that is completely unacceptable as a women's organisation. Any form of violence against women is completely unacceptable. And that is a form of violence against women when you're, where you're attacked for your gender. Mm -hmm. it, it's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So no, I, I don't see, I can't tell you whether it's improved or not in the football grounds because I personally don't have that. And I, I, women haven't in particular told us that, but what they have told us is how they feel. And the, the, the emphasis is on the women that have come to us that they are in particular scared and okay. feel under scrutiny when they're at matches, so. Sure. Thank you. Supplementary, Mary. Thank you, um, convener. I just wanted to pick up on um, the um, communications and the engagements that, that you've had with women across the country, Debbie. And um, when you said you've held a number of events and you consulted with women, can yep. you give us an idea of how many women you consulted? Well, every six weeks we obtain a round table event, which actually I am in charge of uh, kind of organising, not so much as dealing with the round tables. Uh, and we do one every six weeks, which can be anything from eight to 12 women. Uh, we hold road shows, which uh, are last few have been 80 to 120 women have turned up to our roadshow events uh, and our conferences in particular as well which general conversation can come up and because it is round table based after a panel of speakers uh, can be anything up to 120 to 140 women at a time so we do hold a lot of events we do hold a lot of round tables with women and we also speak to women on a daily basis about blogging and we also have a feedback on social media and our website where women can send in their voices if they need to. So we're very inclusive of all voices of women. So have you had any specific events to discuss the repeal of this act? Yes, we held two and events. That's what I'm interested in. So, sorry, yes, we held two events, one, one with young women in particular around it, uh, school age to about 20, 
and we held another roundtable discussion with women of a mixture of ages about the actual, recently, about this, whereas we've held discussions constantly about it. There's always so a talk of the, what's the going on. The two specific events, how many women attended them? There was 20 young women mm -hmm. at the young women's one, and I think there was about 40 at the other one, because it was two roundtables. And did, was the evidence that you gave committee based on, on those 60? No, there was evidence from widespread from roadshows as well, from where women have came to because, us and discussed it. Yeah, because I'm keen to understand how many women support the repeal and how many women don't, given that you said at the start that you've been contacted by 40 women to ask yes, you to withdraw your evidence. Yes, we have, and so I've I was printed just keen them out to get for you. A, a flavour of how many women you actually spoke to that supported the repeal and how many um, were against it. The other thing I wanted to ask you, you say in your evidence that women have reported being groped, physically assaulted or even threatened with rape. And I struggle a bit to, to, to understand why you think the offensive behaviour at football gives you protection against being groped, physically assaulted or threatened with rape because they are all on the range of sexual offences. And I, I, would, I, I would put to you that there is protection under the law for women that are threatened with sexual assault, regardless of this bill? Threatens of rape? You, sexual you, assault. If someone was threatened with rape or sexual assault or violence, out in the street today, they would be protected under the law. I think you'll find there's been numerous threats of rape being taken under breach of peace, which, as far as we're concerned, is not adequate for a, a threatening of rape. Threatening of rape is a form of abuse towards women. We are not covered by hate crime. Hate crime, as in Lord Brackendale's, which we do have a submission into to include women in hate crime. So women are not covered by that. And a lot of abuse is targeted to women because they're easily an easy target for people to target because they're genderly don't fight back as much. And women that are being getting rape threats are not covered by sexual harassment. Sexual harassment has been touched, being actually given a, a, a touch in your body, whereas threatening women just because of their gender by shouting, I'm going to rape you because they say something different, everyone is entitled to their voice. And I'm afraid that that's unacceptable. And historically, and, and police still do, they use an aggravator in breach of the peace. Do you not believe that's sufficient? No. OK, thank you. Very good point. Gender isn't covered in hate crime. Hopefully, that's something Lord Brackendale is going to look at. Hopefully. Fulton, <laughs> uh, a very small. Yeah, I, just, I just wanted to pick up on Mary's point there and ask <coughs> Debbie if the if her views that she's expressed is on the is on behalf of the Scottish Women's Convention because I think that uh, the line of question there from Mary and I know that I know from knowing Mary that she wouldn't have uh, and intended it that way was was slightly unfair and that we've not asked any other organisation how many individuals that they've spoken to. So what we've asked individual uh, agencies and organisations is what their view is on this particular uh, repeal bill. And so I would just ask uh, Debbie if this is a view of the Scottish Women's Convention. This is totally the view of the Scottish Women's Convention. It's We are a very inclusive organisation. We do have hundreds of women submit evidence to us on various things. We are open to any voices that come forward to us, and every woman's voice is important to us. Hence why I did bring up the 40 women that had contacted us over the weekend. We wouldn't ignore the fact that there's been a campaign over the weekend to contact us. Uh, but we do say that the women that turned up to our events in their numbers have said what is included in our consultation response. And we can include voices that didn't come forward to us in a consultation response. So we have given the voices of what we've gotten, and it is a lot of women that we deal with on a daily basis. Then, George. Well, it's, it's just a couple of quick questions. No, because it was particularly on some of the elements of your evidence, and I'm glad that you were able to make it uh, along this week. Um, we heard in evidence to the committee on the 3rd of October, sorry, I'm just trying to find that here, um, 
We heard from Fans Against Criminalisation and I know that Mary touched on some of the, the points that you raised about how you compiled your evidence because that was certainly uh, a point that they had raised. Um, but it was just the, um, Jeanette Finlay from Fans Against Criminalisation had stated we tried to correspond with the Scottish Women's Convention in particular but it was unable to provide us with any details about where it had collected that evidence, how many women, women it represented, the age ranges involved or any basic statistics. And it was just really to give you a chance to to respond to that if that had indeed been the case? Well, I can say that uh, Jeanette Finlay herself did not contact the organisation via email or any form of like that. She did tweet to us uh, occasionally, but her policy is not to respond to tweets uh, that create any sort of negativity. So we wouldn't respond to tweets, but she never actually sent us <coughs> any form of questioning. We did have one woman contact us originally when that evidence was given, uh, but it wasn't Jeanette Finlay herself that contacted us, it was somebody else eh, and we're still in the process of trying to arrange a meeting with her eh, out, of, out of work hours which is causing a bit of issue but we will get round to talking to her at some point but Jeanette Finlay herself has not contacted us unless it's over Twitter. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to you. clarify that. And also to touch on another point that you'd raised in your evidence to the committee uh, where you said that um, the, we didn't, that breach of the peace did not send a strong enough message of condemnation in regards to offensive behaviour that can occur at football events. And I think that's one of the fears that's been articulated. And I think it was Mr Borowski in your, in your opening statement to the committee, you said that we shouldn't underestimate the effect which legislation has on attitudes. Um, because I think that while that has been an argument used in the committee, that we shouldn't be legislating ourselves out of, out of a problem here. I do think that it kind of sets the tone of the type of behaviour that we're willing to accept. And I was just wondering uh, what your opinion was on that. Well, I've got to say, to make sure that we put the view across, our consultation response clearly says that we do feel that there, there is amendments that need to be taken place in this bill and clarifications of how the bill should be used. Also with education to the police forces and to of all ages actually, including in schools, we feel that a lot of education could take place around the bill and how it affects their, their people's use of sectarian language. But we also feel that it's very important to say that women are not covered by anything other than this when it comes to equality. The, the, this actual bill covers the equality strands, which obviously includes women, so therefore gives that woman that extra protection. That if it is targeted, if whatever is said to her or done to her is targeted through this, then they are able to use this bill to get the justice that they deserve. Also, uh, the, we've got to make sure that we write in these sort of things that all women don't agree on what we are putting in. All women will never agree with what we put in. Uh, but we've got to make sure that all women have got a voice. And we are a voice for those women that do feel that they are treated unfairly at these matches. And we are here to give that voice over. So that is why we are basically giving this evidence, evidence session today. Okay, thank you. And George. Thank you, Convener. Can I, I know I've already declared it, but can I just mention for the... Uh, the whole idea of transparency. I'm the convener of the St Martin Independent Supporters Association. Uh, but uh, basically my first question would be, there's this urban myth that seems to have taken over now that the game of shame in 2011 between Rangers and Celtic is what was the knee-jerk reaction to this legislation. And a lot of fans like to paint it, the idea that it was uh, the two managers effectively uh, going toe-to-toe -to -toe or what's parochially known in Glasgow as having a square go uh, with one another. But it wasn't the case that the fact that, you know, the game of shame, there was 34 arrests, the previous game in the whole Strathclyde regional area, there had been 229 arrests uh, during the game. And of that game of shame, 16 people were arrested for offences of a sectarian nature. And is it not the case that with all that background, that came in the back of about three or four games that were constantly kind of getting worse, even so much so that uh, Chick Young, football commentator, said in 40 years of covering old firm matches, this one is up there with one of the most scandalous I have ever seen. And he was talking in the football field and off of the park as well. Now, with that as a backdrop, uh, do the witnesses consider that the legislation was necessary to tackle offensive or hateful behaviour at football? 
to, to tackle that because we are running quite um, a bit behind. So I'd be pleased if members' questions could be as succinct as possible and the answers. Yeah, it, I think I think that's a difficult that's a difficult question to answer. Um, but I don't think that it was a. I, I don't think the issue is around one particular incident or one short period of time, but um, around a, a culture of behaviour that has been around for a long time and which is, uh, has not responded to pressure from society in other ways to change. And um, I'm not saying that the, the, the legislative approach was any more successful, um, but I'm concerned that we still have that situation, that potential for behaviour, that potential for um, a number of arrests, for flashpoints and the like, and removing the legislation without serious consideration about um, what the alternatives are to make a difference um, really is a matter of concern. Panelists want to comment. If not, we'll we'll move on. Can I can I ask an, um, another question, please? Well, I think that's what you, you more or less did. Well, in but I've just got a supplementary on the back of. Yes, what certainly. Said, okay, if it's me. Uh, the whole point of the the actual uh, bill itself is the fact that you know it's what, what a, a reasonable person finds offensive. Now, back at the time scale we're talking about, there was uh, a song called the famine song, which was sung by Ranger supporters with regards to, and it caused such a uh, a stushy, to use a, a Scots word, that UNICEF and the Irish government were actually talking about it as well. Now, surely it's a case of uh, we need to ensure that, uh, you know, uh, there is this, I think it's what you said, uh, Reverend Galloway, uh, the fact that this idea of culture, a lot of football fans believe that is part of their culture. Surely uh, the legislation helps with us to actually that, along with a basket of other measures, to make sure that we actually get to a place where we can actually try and find that this is not allowed anymore. Is that directed to anyone in particular? Uh, well, Reverend Galloway, because he actually yeah. mentioned yeah. Uh, the cultural part. Yeah. <clears throat> but, I mean, you, would, you would have more of a, a view of the evidence of what's happened since, since the Act than, uh, than I have in, in these regards. But um, I, I, I think that um, th there have been a number of instances where people have stopped singing particular things when, when they've known that they've been under additional scrutiny <coughs> and filming at the time. And um, I'm not sure how effective that has been, but um, I would like people to stop singing these songs completely. And I think I'd like them to do it because they know that's wrong, just as a human being, to do it. Um, it, it, it's offensive um, beyond uh, the people that are there. It's offensive to people who hear it when they're watching the highlights of the match or whatever. I would like people to stop doing it now because it's just the wrong thing to do to your neighbours. Mm -hmm. okay. Can and, I ask? Um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. We have to move on. I'm not sure how important the legislation is in that. Right. I'm Horan, afraid you'll have to move I? on, George Adam. Ben, could um, you now come in, please? I think you had a really good go at that, George. We have to move on. Thank you very much, convener. Very good, good morning, panel. I, mean, I think, like Reverend Galloway has said, this legislation is, is not a panacea, but there is um, evidence that it is making individuals think twice about singing certain songs and behaving in certain ways. And in that, that same theme, I note that it's been stated in the Church of Scotland, Church and Society Council evidence that repealing the Act without replacement would be a symbol that our elected representatives do not think that behaving offensively or sending threatening communications is problematic. And in light of that, do you have concerns um, that some supporters m may believe, if this Act is repealed, that certain behaviours are now acceptable and have been decriminalised? <laughs> I think there's a danger that people will interpret things uh, in, in the light of their own uh, predilections. So that, you, you know, the, the, the reasons put forward for repeal may be one thing, 
what people take out of that may well be another. And I think that there are that there's a danger that there are people who will see that as a particular form of victory, which would be very unhelpful indeed. And that would not be that would not be the reason for the repeal if it were to be proceeded with. Um, but it would be the way that it would be perceived. And perceptions are very important in these things. And we think there is a real danger in that regard, unless part of that process was to say very clearly that all of those kinds of behaviour are unacceptable um, and that here are the alternatives that we put forward to ensure that society's way of dealing with them is strengthened. And um, I don't really see that in this process currently. Thank you very much. Any, any other panelists? Mr. Hosmeld, Borowski? Just to agree. I think that thank covers that point. Right, thank you. Mary? Uh, thank you. Just looking for quite a, a simple answer from everyone, really. Um, some of you mentioned in your opening statements about the review that's currently being undertaken by Lord Brackadale. And it's really just in terms of this legislation. Do you feel that it would make more sense for us to wait until the outcome of that review before the, we look at the repeal of this? And just really a straightforward answer from each of the panel. I guess there are no needs to fight for this because we have covered yes. it. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. Morris? Um, thank you, Kavina. Um, good morning, panel. In respect to the most appropriate way to tackle uh, hate crime at football, um, does the panel believe that some form of legislation is required to tackle offensive behaviour and hate crime at football? Again, a yes or no from around, around the room. We'll start with you, sir. Yes. The, the question, I, I don't think that one is amenable quite so clearly to a one-word answer because the question that's in the background of that is whether there's adequate legislation other than this act um, and that's something on which I would look to the lawyers for an answer the one thing that I'm struck by and perhaps this is a partial answer to George Adams as well is that the act is being used there are a substantial number of prosecutions each year and that rather suggests that the general common law and statutory offences that could otherwise be used are regarded by the police and Crown Office as not covering the entire patch. And that's before we come to Section 6 and offensive communications, which I presume we will at some stage, Kavina. No. Yeah. Um, yes, I would very much agree. Uh, in the 90s, I spent a lot of time working with people who were victims of racial harassment, and at that point, racial harassment was very often prosecuted as being a breach of the peace, and it simply didn't reflect the impact, um, the social significance, uh, the um, dangers that, that, that such acts, uh, that such behaviour uh, put forward. So again, I believe that the breach, whilst it would deal with the the physical thing, it wouldn't actually deal with the motivation or the behaviour or the social impact of it. So I would worry if um, we were to move back to a position with a, a catch-all of breach. Debbie, you That's exactly my opinion as well. Yeah. I've basically stated that earlier as well, that the breach of the peace just isn't, isn't what is needed to actually capture the fact that it is being a woman that is being abused for, a, for being a woman. It, it's, it's not enough. So. Mm -hmm. okay. Reverend Galloway? Uh, I think that uh, before the legislation, um, the, uh, the, incident, the, the ways that um, the law was being enforced at football matches was um, relatively ineffective. Um, I'm, I think that it has given an additional focus in that regard. And so I think that there is, a need, there is a need to not remove that focus, whether it's through this legislation or other, but there is a need for that focus to be there that says to people, these contexts particularly where we have put up with behaviour that we wouldn't elsewhere, no longer will that be the case because that's not what football's for and that's not what it's about. Thank you. And Ms. Torrent, last one. I, I think the importance of legislation, which is well thought out, is suitable and proportionate. Uh, to the aim it's trying to, uh, what it's trying to achieve, um, is is very important, and that's not that's not in question. But I think Mary Gougen uh, made a good point about um, 
we shouldn't necessarily be legislating ourselves out of a problem. I, I, I think it's important to appreciate that accompanying legislation, whether it's the repeal, uh, whether, sorry, it's the, the, this particular act or other legislation which has similar uh, offences attached to them, um, we, we need to, I think that has to be accompanied by by something other than simply just legislation, words on a page. So it's incumbent, I think, upon government to make sure that there is awareness uh, across the country um, in terms of what is, I mean, in all honesty, people should know <laughs> what's right and wrong. And I think we've got to be careful. We talk about the, the sending out the wrong message earlier on, but there's, there's a danger that we underestimate the public. I think most people do know uh, what is right and what's wrong, yeah. what's appropriate and inappropriate behaviour, whether it's at football or in the street or whatever, uh, or in a pub. But um, so I think quite often, unfortunately, um, many people, it's alcohol fueled and it would, doesn't matter a jot what law is in place, um, they'll uh, behave inappropriately uh, anyway. But uh, just to, uh, yeah, I think just on the point, I think we, th there has to be more than simply just throwing legislation at a problem. Uh, for example, uh, in terms of the religious aggravation statistics that were released in May of this year, uh, 57 of those were anti-Catholic or against Catholicism, uh, targeted Catholicism. And that's been consistently high for a number of years now. It took a slight dip last year, but it's always been over 50%. And I think the next group under that is uh, Protestant, uh, anti-Protestant behaviour, which was 20, 23 or 24%. Now, Catholics make up only 16% of the Scottish population, so it's significantly disproportionate. And I think we need to try, and rather than simply throwing legislation at things, which of course has its, has its place, but we have to get to the root of the problem. And I think it's important to hear, and government's done it in other areas, to, to have an acceptance and acknowledgement on the part of government that there is a distinct problem here. And I still think there is a distinct anti-Catholic problem uh, in Scotland. And sectarianism, Efren Borowski made a very, very good point when he said that it's an iffy concept, and I think that's absolutely right. I think it is an iffy concept. If something is anti-Catholic, we should call it anti-Catholic. If it's anti-Protestant, call it anti-Protestant. If it's anti-Semitic, call it anti-Semitic. And I think we need the leadership that Reverend Galloway referred to from government on this particular issue, is we need to get to the root of problems. First of all, we need to accept that a problem actually exists. Okay, thank you, Karina. Uh, interested in the panel's views on uh, other initiatives that tackle the root cause uh, of sectarianism, such as education. We heard in the last uh, panel <coughs> people talking about education programmes that could uh, work, and I'm thinking particularly in schools. Uh, you'll know that the committee undertook a survey uh, of schools, so we know that a lot of young people know about this act. So I'm, I'm wanting to um, know if you can frame your answers in terms of education of young people and how a repeal of the act, given that a lot of young people know about the current act and have based their thoughts uh, on, you know, on what, what they replied to the survey on that, what, uh, how that might, how a repeal might impact on any education programmes. And I think we've touched on it in the wider society of it might send out a wrong message or, or other people have said it might not. So um, I know that we're running out of time, so convener will be looking over at me. So um, that's why I'm asking if it can be framed in, in that light, because that's really what I'm wanting to tease out. Thanks. Unfortunately, education is open-ended. It's not indoctrination. You give young people information, they make of it what they want, and that, therefore, is itself informed by their pre-existing prejudices. That's simply a sad fact, but I can give you one appalling example that I just heard about this week. Um, this parliament, this government, um, supports the programme of school visits to Auschwitz, the intention of which is to educate young people about where hatred can lead. A young girl in the Jewish community who had recently visited Auschwitz with a youth group received a text message or a tweet from her supposed best friend of an extreme and outrageous um, anti-Semitic nature. Now, what that shows is that education sometimes actually provides the ammunition that people can use 
to fuel their pre-existing hatred. So I don't think that education alone can be simply looked to any more than, it, than legislation alone can be looked to as a panacea. Um, in this particular context, obviously, there's a lot to be done. And um, I don't want to end up merely swapping statistics, but the hate crime statistics published by the government and um, Crown Office that Anthony's already referred to actually show that proportionately to the size of the community, he's absolutely right. There is a disproportionate representation of anti-Catholic hatred. The level of anti-Semitic hatred is 40 times that relative to the size of the community. There's a lot of work still to be done. Perhaps um, I'll, one more. I'll yep. go next. Uh, as far as we're concerned, education is vitally important for anything, uh, but we have stated that there needs to be more education around sectarianism in schools and the impact that it has on each other uh, is very important. Young women, we've had a mixture of young women from, from all areas uh, come to us and we're not just the, the Catholic and Protestant sides of it, it's a mixture of everything and the fact that they feel intimidated for going to certain schools is indicative of what happens in daily life. They, they, it's very important that any young woman, or I can go as far to say young people, uh, should feel safe in their, their own systems. And if education has failed in that sort of way, maybe, maybe we should be educating them more on it. And that's why we call for more education on this sort of form. It, we would hope that it would say, uh, as a personal level, I would hope that just no, people wouldn't do that to each other, but it, it doesn't work like that. So, uh, yeah, as far as young women have came to us, education is vitally important. And I, and I, I think that um, there, is, there is a lot of good work going on. I know that there's a lot of good work going on in schools, organisations like Nil by Mouth. I know that the football authorities that are sitting behind there, the churches, various, various folk are involved in good education. I suppose what I was trying to say you know, um, look at was if we've got, there's a wide knowledge about this particular act uh, amongst school children and, and young people um, and what in uh, any education programme that's going on, where do you think the repeal act would fit into that? And I know we might only have time for, for maybe one more answer, convener, but that, that I was, and I think the two, the two responses so far have been absolutely great and I, I, agree, with, I agree with everything that's been said, but I'm looking at the repeal act in the context of any further work there. I think they're separate things. Um, the, there's, there's, there is a huge amount of very good work goes on locally, very committed work, and in the south side of Glasgow we work with hundreds and hundreds of young people um, across the education spectrum, and we take about 100 young people, 16-year-olds, from the local Catholic secondary and the non-denominational secondary together to Belfast each year to um, do additional reflection on that. Well, there's an enormous amount of that work goes on. Um, the, the question is whether at, at this point a repeal that's too hasty um, sits in contradiction to that or, or, or whether the, the um, engagement with these issues just a wee bit with a wee bit more consider, a bit longer consideration. I think young people understand very clearly that sectarianism um, is like racism, is like Islamophobia, is like anti-Semitism, and they, they develop in their lives a response to that weave of attitudes and behaviours. And I think we want to support them in doing that and be very careful before we introduce any message that could suggest to them that it's not um, as important as they're beginning to think it is. And to the panel, we're running very, um, very badly behind time. So could your answers be as succinct as possible, please? We want to get through all the questions. Mr. Ortons, very quickly. Um, I think that if we were to uh, repeal the Act and to move to a purely educative system, we would go back the way the same way, as we've said already. Um, my concern would be particularly that if there is no sanction, young people would go to a game, see behaviour, which is 
we would say is unacceptable and believe that as there is no sanction, they can behave in that way. Right, and Fulton. Oh, yeah. um, thanks, convener. Um, so just moving on, it was mentioned earlier about um, the, the, the concerns around re repeal of Section 6. So I suppose I just want to ask uh, the panellists um, if they've got, uh, if they're able to elaborate on any concerns they've got about an increase in online abuse and threats particularly, and, um, you know, if if they've got the concerns that they've already, well, four of the panel members have already expressed regarding, sorry, I'm just trying to join up the two questions, uh, about the repeal of Section 6, specifically of the Act. Thanks. You're from, and um, because you've written evidence, it would be good to hear from you. Yeah. Um, sadly, I suppose I'm more of an expert on online abuse than I am on football. Uh, I myself have been targeted for being a witness in a court case um, by somebody who's obviously taken the trouble to find my personal email address, not sending messages to an organisation. Um, we have to, I think, take account of the world that we now live in, at which the electronic world, at any rate, doesn't recognise national boundaries. And one of the things that the lawyers tell us about Section 6 is that it's an important transnational power which catches um, conduct which otherwise would not be caught by Scots law. And that, I think, itself is another important reason um, why this, if it isn't retained in exactly its present form, should be amended rather than repealed. And given the runaway growth of social media is probably a matter that needs more careful and extended consideration of the kind that Lord Brackadale is giving it, um, rather than simply knee-jerk repeal. OK, that's extra territorial aspect that isn't covered elsewhere in Scots law. Uh, Debbie? Yeah, just quickly, uh, Section 6 is vitally important to be kept, to be honest, from what we've been given. Uh, it's very important that they criminalise online abuse uh, of any sorts, and it's not just young people that are affected by social media. It can be all ages that can be affected by social media, and we need to remember that. There is not just young women that come to us with abuse on social media. It's also women of all ages. Uh, and it's very important that sectarianism online has to be dealt with appropriately. The other members would concur. Panel members, right. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. So staying on Section 6, the threatening communications piece, uh, a number of you have suggested uh, that one of the key functions of the Act is that it sends out this message. Uh, so just unpacking that in terms of the, act, the, the overall Act, specifically on Section 6, is it your view that Section 6 has any impact in sending a message that that particular type of behaviour is unacceptable, illegal, or both? Who would like to answer this, Mr Oswald? Um, Section 6 um, is perhaps closest to uh, prohibitions already in place around incitement to racial hatred. It's a very high bar. There are very few prosecutions um, every year on that issue. But it's a very, very serious issue. So I would um, be concerned if Section 6 were to be lost. It may not be a piece of, it may not be a clause which is used particularly often, but it has a very, very strong significance. So. It, but if we can pick up on that, uh, it's, this behaviour is still going on, and yet, as you rightly point out, Mr Oswald, there have been very few prosecutions under this Section 6, which, uh, to go back to the point Mr Borovsky made earlier on, uh, when he said this Act is being used, will it rather suggest this part of the Act isn't being used? Why not? Well, you would probably need to direct that to the police and the prosecutors. What I can say is that incitement to racial hatred, which is a very similar type of offence, is used maybe on a dozen occasions every year. Um, it does not, it, the frequency of its use does not undermine um, the importance of those prosecutions. Yes, sir. Could I just add two brief points to that? 
One is that my understanding from, um, again, some of the other submissions to this committee is that what Section 6 adds to other legislation is the extraterritorial element. And if that's the case, then it may very well be that one of the reasons why it's not used, or at least it doesn't get to court as much as uh, it might, is because of the unhelpful attitude of the social media internationals uh, who are unprepared to provide the evidence that would allow a prosecution to succeed. So it may not be to do with the nature of the offence. And the thing that concerns me most is that individuals, whether they're members of my community or any other community, should feel safe, and in particular, should feel safe in their own homes. And what we're talking about in Section 6 is people who are being targeted effectively anonymously by the so-called bedroom warriors who don't see the effect of their actions. But the result of that can be exceptionally serious indeed for people's sense of well-being, their welfare, and indeed their continued existence. And finally then, the logical progression from that is to ask, given the lack of prosecutions, uh, given that this seems to be the, the less well-known part of the Act, uh, what is the panel's view on what would happen in terms of online abuse, in terms of the type, in terms of the volume, if that part of the Act were to be repealed? And Anthony? First of all, um, I've personally been set, subjected to online abuse for my faith, and I know I'm not alone. I mean, it's a growing problem. It's a, it's a vile problem. Um, and I think Efren Borowski is correct to refer to the, the Lord Brackadale Review. I think that's an opportunity to uh, achieve the most appropriate legislation in order to tackle that particular problem. Section 6, as Liam Kerr says, is not used very often, and I think that's something that we need to be looked at. Um, but I think one of the problems here is... Um, is, is behaviour of adults. I mean, I think we, we, we tend to sort of look at child, young people and, and, and blame them for some of the behaviours or most of the behaviour that we see on social media, but baiting by celebrities, even civic leaders um, on, on Twitter, for example, it creates a culture which suge suggests to young people that social media is just a free-for-all and they can behave in any which way they like. Um, and that's hen you know, hence we have the bedroom warriors that, that Efrem Borowski referred to. So uh, I think, again, this is something that it may maybe needs ownership. Um, you know, the Act is not being used, Section 6 isn't being used very often. Um, there are perhaps other provisions, some will certainly argue that there are other provisions which would cover the behaviour um, that is cited in, in Section 6. Um, you could take, you could repeal the Act, um, but I still think you're, you're going to have that, that problem um, either way. So, again, I think it needs ownership and it needs some, something from, it needs government um, to really, really tackle and to, to, come, to, a, to come to a solution that, uh, that, that, that tackles this behaviour. And, of course, we'll go back maybe to, to um, Fulton McGregor was talking about education, and I think that's vitally, vitally important. But I think if, we're going, if we want to change the culture of online hate and online abuse, I think we need to look to the adults first and foremost in the way that they behave because they're setting an example to young children that certain behaviours are acceptable. And very, very briefly. Can I just quickly add that you've got to remember social media can sometimes be anonymous and that's very important to, to state because you don't know who the abuse is coming from and it can be names that and pictures that don't represent a person and that's where it becomes very dangerous if you don't get that information from companies about who this person is behind mm -hmm. the, the image that is their social media account. So I think you need to remember that's vitally important. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I've always maintained a policy that the, the committee would ask all the questions first. It's our duty to um, scrutinise this bill, but given James Kelly has to leave and has time constraints, I'm going to bring him in now, and then Mary will conclude our um, line of question after James has exhausted his questions. Okay, um, I'm appreciative of that, convener, and I'm also appreciative of the time constraints. I just want to raise one point um, with the panel. We've heard for, in previous evidence sessions that uh, in terms of charges brought under this act, 72% of the people 
who have been charged are under the age of 30. And we've also heard evidence that a lot of these are people who have been brought into the criminal justice system for the first time. Uh, does the panel share the concerns that have been raised about the number of first-time offenders that have been brought into the criminal justice system? And do you think that the uh, alternatives to prosecution should be sought in some cases? <coughs> Chris. Um, again, if you, if you look at the profile of people who are convicted of racially motivated offences, you'll find that 50% of people who are convicted under, are under the age of 20, 50% of them are under the age of 16. So I think what you're seeing is a reflection of people who are more likely to carry out these types of acts than any particular focus um, on younger people. As to whether or not people are being brought into the criminal justice system because of, um, because of the act, I would say it's because of their behaviour rather than the act. The act is simply setting out um, behaviour which is felt to be socially damaging. Okay. Uh, I think we should always be looking at alternatives to prosecution. I think, and not simply with this legislation, but in our approach, in our approach to people, and particularly in our approach to young people. How do we, how do we encourage people away from behaviour that is detrimental to other people and to society? Um, really important, but but not to have not to have a sanction on that behaviour would would be very unfortunate, um, and. There does come a point where people have to learn that behaviour is unacceptable and won't be tolerated. And uh, it's always unfortunate for me when a young person comes into the criminal justice system. Um, but, the, but there are flexible responses of the system to people and we need to exercise those. But you wouldn't do away with all legislation as a way of enabling that. I think. Euphrem, did you want to come in? Um, I would agree with everything that's just been said by the previous two speakers. I think um, in the absence, well, maybe I'm wrong, unless there is um, independent evidence that shows that the proportions of prosecutions are out of line with the proportions of perpetrators, um, then that is simply a fact. And I suspect <coughs> that if you look at, for example, driving offences, you may find exactly the same offence, the, the, exactly the same effect. Okay. Anyone else? No one else want to comment? Right. Do you finish? Yep. Uh, yeah. Mary. Uh, thank you, convener. I'll um, roll my two questions in, into one, and I'd be grateful if the panel, you can, you can answer with a, a yes or a, or a no if you have a, a view. Do the panel think that the 2012 Act has had an impact on reducing sectarianism, and I specifically mean sectarianism, and there is no definition of sectarianism in Scots law, would it be beneficial to have one? Who would like to start? Ephraim. I'm happy to start at the end of that. Um, whether or not there's a definition of sectarianism in Scots law, um, is possibly a different question, but as a couple of us have already said, the issue is not sectarianism as properly defined, which itself is, dare I say it, a sectarian concept, because sectarianism is an intra-religious phenomenon. And what we're talking about here is religious hatred or hatred of a religion, and it's interesting actually, I think a couple of people have referred to this as well, the way in which the uh, statistics are published does not talk about incidents directed against somebody of a particular faith, but motivated by hatred of that particular faith. And that, frankly, I think is how it should be. So um, having said all that about the second uh, part of Mary Fee's question, I don't think I can answer the first. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else want to comment? In, ter yeah, in terms of the, the impact, um, I, I don't believe uh, the 2012 Act, to, to answer briefly, has had any uh, impact as far as I can see. Um, in terms of overall behaviour and, and sectarian, tackling sectarianism, in terms of, uh, I, I would refer also 
on the issue or on the point of sectarianism and the definition of it, um, I would refer to my earlier evidence that I think it's, it's an unhelpful term and I think we need to call specific behaviour for what it really is um, and not just have it uh, uh, under this banner of sectarianism. That's helpful, thank you. Does anyone else want to comment? No. The, the Act hasn't been around for very long. <coughs> sectarianism has been long, around for a very long time. And um, I'm, I, think, I think I would want to have seen over a slightly longer period, along with other initiatives, what a difference might be made. And it, in, in the advisory group on tackling sectarianism, I think the hardest thing that we ever that we had to deal with was to try to define sectarianism, and I th I, you know we, we um, banded that around for um, quite a long time and came up with something in the end that was entirely unsatisfactory. But um, we have different forms of sectarianism present in our society, and that but that intra issue that that Ephraim um, is talking about is is clearly part of that. Um, and it's true in the, within the Christian tradition, it's true within the Muslim tradition, you know. Um, th these these uh, things are, are very difficult, but we just have to accept that they're there and they have to be responded to. And where, they're, where they become detrimental to people on the other side of that or um, within our society at large, then we have a responsibility, even where there are sensitivities, to intervene and try and make a difference to the behaviours. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Thank you, Convener. That concludes our line of questions. Can I thank the witnesses particularly for being um, brief when, when they, they were asked to be. We're under huge time constraints to hear another panel and to hear all the people that we want to hear to when we're scrutinising this legislation. But thank you all very much for appearing to, today. That was very helpful. Can I spend, uh, suspend now briefly to allow a change over of witnesses and a comfort break of five minutes?
I welcome our second panel of witnesses giving evidence today on the offensive behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Repeal Scotland Bill. Desmond Ziola, Glasgow Bar Association, Alan McCready, Head of Research, Law Society of Scotland, Professor Fiona Leverick. Professor of Criminal Law and Criminal Justice, University of Glasgow, Stuart Reagan, CEO, Scottish Football Association, and Neil Doncaster, Chief Executive, Scottish Professional Football League. Can I thank you all for your written submissions? And I can I thank the, the last two witnesses, particularly Stuart Reagan and Neil Doncaster. It has been quite difficult to find a mutually convenient time, and I'm very pleased that you were able to attend today and also that you managed to make what has been an excellent submission, as have all the others um, that we've had from the panellists today. Move with that and move straight to questions. And Rona. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, can I ask, um, in pretty much general terms, this bill proposes to repeal the 2012 Act in its entirety. Do you think that's a sensible uh, pr proposition? And if so, why? Answer that. Do we, well, good morning, panel. I'm grateful for the opportunity to come before you this morning and speak on behalf of the Glasgow Bar Association. In relation to the 2012 bill, it's been stated before that it's probably uh, unfortunate that the two sections, section one and section six, were almost amalgamated into one act. And I, I, I sense from the questioning of the other panel before us that clearly that one issue from those panel members was section six in its entirety and their concerns of it being repealed. However, can I just touch upon a point one of the committee members made to one of those panel members earlier that in relation to section six there was a question as to why it's not being used. I think it was uh, Mr Kerr that had raised the issue there and I think as well in the Police Scotland own response to this committee they say that it's because of the narrow scope of section six and the wording of section six. So clearly it's not working, clearly it's not applicable that the police feel comfortable in using it. And if they're not feeling comfortable in using it, then I accept what the faith groups are saying. However, if the police service of Scotland are not comfortable in using Section 6 due to its narrow scope, then surely it's time to revisit it as part of maybe the other suggestions and comments that have been made regarding Section 1. Thank you. Mr McCready. Thank you, uh, thank you, Convener, and to the Justice Committee for affording the Law Society an opportunity to uh, provide oral evidence uh, this morning. Uh, the Law Society has no view at all uh, on whether or not uh, this uh, Act, the 2012 Act, uh, should be repealed and uh, take, very much takes the view that that's a matter for the legislature. It, it did, however, uh, provide uh, some evidence, uh, both uh, written evidence and oral evidence, at the bill stage, and much of that has been uh, replicated in its uh, written, written evidence to, to this committee. Uh, it has in the past and continues to, to highlight some of the more practical uh, aspects, uh, the, uh, the, the clarity that the Act affords and its, uh, its enforceability. And uh, those are some of the issues which uh, remain very much alive for the society now. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Leverinke? Um, I don't have a particularly strong view as to whether the Act should be repealed or not. Um, I think the main reason for that is I would just confirm what some other witnesses have said in other sessions, which is that pretty much all of the behaviour in the Act is covered by other criminal offences, um, whether that's common law, breach of the peace, or whether that's statutory offences. I think there's advantages to keeping the Act, the probably two advantages. One is it is very specific in... When somebody's convicted under that act, it's recorded very specifically the type of behaviour that they engaged in. Whereas if you're using a common law offence like breach of the peace, you, you lose that specificity. Um, although having said that, breach of the peace can be racially or religiously aggravated. So you, you can capture that there. Um, the symbolic point, I think, is a good one that, that some people have made, that if you did repeal the act now, that might, I don't know, that might send a message that all of a sudden this type of behaviour, sectarian chanting and so on, is, is acceptable. Um, so you'd have to have, I think, a very strong education campaign around that. Um, the argument for repeal is possibly that the act has lost the confidence of the people governed by it, football supporters. Um, even though it doesn't actually create any new kind of criminal offences, it creates new criminal offences, but the, the conduct was already covered, it may well have lost the confidence of the people that are, are targeted by it. And it's certainly very, very unusual 
um, almost unheard of for a, an act containing criminal offences to be specifically targeted at football supporters. We did a review of, of worldwide legislation for Lord Brackadale for his hate crime review, and it was really the only other kind of comparable piece of legislation we could find was in England and Wales. Um, they prohibit um, is it racist and offensive chanting at football matches. There's nowhere else that has specifically football-related criminal offences. So you can see why football fans might feel or perceive that they're being targeted by the Act. Um, but the reality is that pretty much everything in the Act is covered by other criminal offences. So Thank you. I'll stop there. Mr Regan. Thank you, um, and thanks to the committee for giving me the opportunity to come this morning at short notice, um, as we're unable to attend on the 14th, so that's really appreciated. Um, like uh, previous speakers, I would say that um, whether the, uh, the act should be repealed is a matter for others rather than the Scottish Football Association, but I would like to, to make a number of points re relating to the act. Um, back in 2011, um, after the Celtic Rangers Scottish Cup replay which led to the summit being set up by uh, Alex Salmond and um, supported by Stephen House. Um, we participated fully and debated fully about making improvements um, to behaviour in Scotland generally and I think it's fair to say the Scottish FA at the time said anything that can help improve behaviour has to be seen as a, as a positive thing. Um, and I, I would stick by that, and I think that the direction of travel of the Act was definitely something that, that, that was um, to be encouraged. But things have changed since then. We, we've moved on. The Scottish FA completely overhauled its disciplinary procedures in 2011, introduced a new independent judicial system. Uh, we've strengthened our guidelines for unacceptable conduct um, in, in partnership with the SPFL. Um, and we've seen a number of other developments, including the introduction of supporter liaison officers across the, um, the Scottish Professional League clubs, um, which have worked very closely with um, fans groups in order to try and improve behaviour. And I think that the Act, whilst it might have had the best of intentions, has served to damage relationships between a number of key stakeholders and football fans in a recent survey, 71% of them out of 13,000 said that the Act um, hadn't been effective and therefore if that is the case and there is a belief it's not working, if the police aren't using certain parts of it, then there has to be questions about its effectiveness. Um, I think the final point I'd like to make is that the review of hate crime has the potential to pick up many aspects that are perhaps positive in regards to the Offensive Behaviour and Threatening Communications um, uh, Act. And um, I recently met with Lord Brackadale and uh, expressed a number of points about how um, he may be able to address hate crime generally, which can be um, seen to affect or to be put in place to address all of Scottish society and not target football fans unfairly. And I think the, 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 the key point I'd like to make in this evidence session is that football has been targeted and singled out and a piece of legislation has been put in place that focuses exclusively on football. Um, no other sport has that. No other element of society has that. And I looked back over the last 24 hours in preparing for this session and identified, um, for example, in the music industry between 2004 and 2013 at Tea in the Park, there were 3,600 incidents, three attempted murders, three drug-related deaths, 10 sexual assaults, one abduction, and 2,000 drug offences. There wasn't a summit called after the, the Tea in the Park events. There was no uh, emergency legislation put in place. And I think football has been targeted and many of the issues that the Act has sought to address can be addressed by other legislation. Can I just Thanks. ask, on that basis then, if you accept that sectarian songs are mostly sung at football matches? I think um, football gets painted or gets tarred unfairly with being the source of a lot of unacceptable behaviour. None of us like to hear sectarian songs being chanted. They don't just happen at football matches. It's a society thing. thing. And one of the previous speakers, uh, Mr. the Reverend Galloway, uh, said that you know, this is an issue that's been around for hundreds of years. Yes, there are incidents at football matches 
we believe we have rules and guidelines now in place to address those, and I think the legislation can be caught, or the, 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 the direction of the legislation can be caught in other existing and perhaps amended legislation through the hate crime review. Okay, Mr Doncaster. Um, thank you. There's little I can add to what Stuart has already said. Um, what I perhaps can add, though, is that there's actually very little interaction between the Act and the work that the clubs and ourselves have to do. So the Act is concerned with a criminal standard of proof and sectarian behaviour, whereas the work that we carry out relates to unacceptable conduct, which is a much broader concept, and there's also a much lower standard of proof. It's balance of probabilities. So we have very uh, detailed rules, very detailed guidelines that govern unacceptable conduct, and we work very closely with clubs to minimise the incidence of unacceptable conduct within Stadia. Okay, can I just um, expand that a bit then by asking you, have the 41 recommendations drawn up by the Joint Action Group all been implemented? And if so, has this resulted, mm -hmm. in your opinion, in improved behaviour at and around football matches? Well, we're um, going through a process at the moment in conjunction with government um, monitoring what is going on at games. We have uh, delegates, SPL delegate, SPFL delegates, that we appoint to all of the Premiership uh, matches. Uh, all televised games within the uh, league and any other high-profile games. We take reports from those delegates and we then use that information uh, to take action if required against the clubs concerned in accordance with our rules. So we will and are monitoring uh, what is going on within Stadia and uh, it's too early to say at this stage uh, you know, what the trends are. Okay, then directly answer my question. Have the 41 recommendations been implemented? I have not that information to hand. Mr Regan, do you want to...? Without having a list of the 41 recommendations in front of me, I, I couldn't go through one by one. What I would say is that we were part of the group that actually designed the 41 recommendations, and we worked hard in the June after the uh, summit met to change our rules, to change our governance uh, procedures, to actually implement new initiatives. We worked with the SPFL to... Uh, to deliver a single league body for Scottish football, which resulted in the merger of the SPL and the SFL. And therefore, many of the issues that were identified at the time have been addressed. Whether that's all 41, I couldn't say, but I would certainly like to think that the majority, if not all of them, have been addressed. Can you just clarify when the Joint Action Group was set up? Um, the Joint Action Group was set up after the um, Celtic Rangers Scottish Cup mm -hmm. semi-final in March 2011. Mm -hmm. So and there's been it was no monitoring of the, of the recommendations since then? You're in, not sure how many have been implemented? Well, certainly we've, we've wor worked with the various authorities. We've been working with the Scottish Government ever since. The Scottish Government, as you know, has a football lead. And since 2011, we have regular meetings with the Scottish Government. And that has led to a number of changes. For example, the strengthening of the guidelines on unacceptable conduct, the introduction of delegates at matches, uh, not just in the league, but also in, in the Scottish Cup. So I would say that we have worked very, very closely with the Government. We haven't got a tracker that sits and looks at every single one of the recommendations, um, but I can certainly, if this is something that, that you're looking for feedback on, we could certainly provide that for that you. That would be, be helpful. Absolutely fine. Yeah. Yes, Thank that you. would be great. Thank you. Uh, George, could you ask for a supplementary yeah. on the other one from the SFA question? Oh, both of them at the same time. It's supplementary initially. Uh, just, just so you can expand on it, Stuart, just a wee bit, because I, I'm aware of what the supporter liaison officers uh, are meant to do, because I know from European <laughs> football, and particularly Netherlands, uh, there was a great kind of change in fan behaviour because of it. Could you possibly expand on it for my colleagues in the committee so they could understand uh, what exactly that programme is? Yeah, of course. Um, the Scottish FA has funded um, Supporters Direct Scotland to implement a programme which is looking at the introduction of a supporter liaison officer um, at every one of the top clubs um, and then working the, the way down the league. Uh, in some cases, that's a full-time paid position. In other cases, it's a voluntary position. But the role of the um, supporter liaison officer is to effectively act as a bridge between um, the club and supporters groups and then back into the football authorities as well. Um, they run a number of, uh, of workshops, um, they run an, a number of training sessions uh, where they share best practice, they work with groups to identify uh, ways of improving behaviour, um, looking at travel initiatives for example, to get fans safely to grounds, um, and you know, work with the, the club to identify areas of discontent and put in, in place action plans to address them. 
Okay, thanks for that. C can I uh, pause, go on to my, my question as well? And currently, uh, there seems to be three debates going on with regards to this bill. There's a political one here. There's a one that seems to be happening between Rangers and Celtic fans. And then there's all the rest of us as football fans discussing this. Now, there seems to be difference of opinions uh, hugely. I think Nil by Mouth recently did some work where it found that fans of other teams, apart from Rangers and Celtic, said sectarianism was a real problem. Rangers and Celtic fans said it wasn't. Now, one of the things that uh, I'd like to ask is, uh, you know, what exactly are the SFA and the SPFL doing to actually make sure that they are... Uh, part of the solution in this whole process? In, specifically in relation to sec sectarianism? sectarianism. Mm -hmm. um, well, certainly um, the Scottish FA partners with organisations like Shore Racism, the Red Card, for example. Um, our clubs also uh, have initiatives in place. Um, we have worked with the Scottish Government. We've had um, seminars and workshops um, for... Uh, various parties at Hampden Park, um, led by Show Racism, the red card. We've changed our rules to ensure that we can deal with unacceptable conduct, including sectarianism um, and other forms of, of uh, unacceptable behaviour. Um, so there are a whole raft of areas that, that you know, I, I would say we're, we're working on and continue to work on with various stakeholders across the game, and including the Scottish Government. Yeah. Yeah, if I can add that we've uh, employed uh, an employee specifically, uh, the bulk of his role is to uh, monitor what is going on in our games, uh, to use the reports of the SPFL delegates to, uh, to ensure that we have a record of what unacceptable conduct is taking place where and ensure as best we can a consistency of approach to it. Um, there's no doubt that we uh, have amended our rules considerably, amended our guidelines uh, that clubs uh, have to take account of uh, considerably and the focus of the SPFL and all of its member clubs remains on uh, tackling unacceptable conduct where it occurs. Yet today, the uh, Reverend Galloway told us, and albeit as a uh, Church of Scotland minister, he was saying uh, from the perspective of someone that's not a football fan, uh, but he did say that he does not, he's not seeing leadership from football authorities in any shape or form. Uh, do you have anything to add after what you've just said with regards to that? Well, um, I, I would encourage um, the Reverend Galloway to actually come and spend some time with Scottish football clubs and also with the authorities and look at exactly what is happening and some of the education programmes that are taking place, some of the literature that's out there. And I would, I would without, um, without um, minimising or diminishing uh, sectarianism and its, uh, its impact on Scottish society, I would like the committee to be aware that um, Scottish football um, has been seen to be the 12th best behaved association out of 55 in Europe. And when I look around at some of the footage from other countries, for particularly Eastern Europe, um, you know, with uh, uh, huge issues with uh, police with riot shields and police horses on, on the pitch, um, you know, pyrotechnics right across the, the stadium, I do believe that we control behaviour um, you know, as, as well as we can. There's always room for improvement, but I would like to put this into perspective. You know, there are occasional outbursts of sectarian activity, and we try and deal with those. Um, you know, this is not something that happens at every football match across, um, across the Scottish society. Let's be honest with each other, Stuart. It's basically... Uh, it's like what I said earlier on. There's three debates. There's the political, there's Rangers and Celtic fans, and there's the rest of us. You know, so the whole scenario is it may not be all the games in Scottish football, but the problem is I never let my son go to see St Murnley against Rangers or Celtic mm -hmm. until he was well over 12, same with my daughter as well. Neither of them because I didn't want to have them to go through that kind of problem. It's still an issue. It's still a major issue. And uh, the situation we have now, is, uh, it was already said by the Reverend Galloway as well, it's a cultural thing. And Rangers and Celtic supporters will say automatically it's part of our culture. But when does it become like songs like the Famine Song, which I mentioned earlier on, and other popular songs that are taken away from their actual uh, kind of part? It's always been a part of football, but it's done in a sectarian manner. You know, what are the football authorities actually doing to say that's unacceptable? Well, what, um, and Neil can comment more than myself on this, but what the... Um uh, the clubs are doing is the clubs are providing stewards to accompany their fans to monitor behaviour both at, uh, um, at their home grounds but more importantly when they go away. We tend to see more activity perhaps away from home 
where perhaps there's less control than, than at those home grounds. Um, I think the other, the other thing that's going on is, is education uh, at a club level. And, and finally, within the SPFL delegate reports that Neil referred to earlier, um, there is the monitoring of any sectarian uh, activity and a record kept of any um, uh, b bad behaviour, if you like, and that's something that we've agreed to share with government as part of our uh, ongoing focus in this area. Yeah, I think I'd echo uh, what Stuart's comments. If there are concerns around what's going on at football, we would absolutely invite people to come along, see what's going on, see what's going on at matches, um, see what the work that the, the clubs are carrying out in the communities. We've, you know, we've seen boys against bigotry from, um, from Celtic. We've seen follow with pride uh, from Rangers. There's an awful lot of work that's going on to address what is a wider societal issue, and we welcome that. Can I just pursue the issue of discipline with the SFA before we go on to the wider aspects which will involve more of the, um, the, the panel? Um, I noticed that in your uh, written statement, you, and today you've talked about the revised guidance, um, two members last year um, both giving enhanced powers to sanction um, under their jurisdiction any, any behaviour that does not... Um, comply with having taken all reasonably practical steps to prevent such behaviour. Could you outline what these, um, what these um, steps might be? What could a club do to, to comply with this, uh, which is effectively, I think, a test, really, whether you would intervene or not? Absolutely. All reasonably practical steps. Very happy to answer that. Um, I, I don't want to bore uh, the committee. We've got Annex 5 to our rules, which is specifically guidance two clubs on what they should be doing. And in fact, the rules state that any commission that's convened uh, that looks at uh, alleged breaches of our rules when it comes to unacceptable conduct, the commission has to look at the extent to which clubs have adhered to our guidelines, which are extremely in depth. And I would urge any uh, member of the committee who's interested to, to look at Annex 5, which is available online, and to go through that extremely long list of all the things that we, uh, we expect clubs to be doing uh, to address uh, unacceptable conduct before it occurs, uh, to deal with it when it does occur, and then uh, the change to the rules uh, last summer to deal with the aftermath of unacceptable conduct when it has occurred and identify any perpetrators. So we continue to refine the rules, we continue to make improvements. There is a genuine and ongoing focus by the League and its clubs on ensuring that unacceptable conduct is tackled where it occurs and that we try and prevent it from occurring and where it has occurred, uh, appropriate measures are taken after the event. Yes, yeah, so there should be absolutely no doubt of what um, that test means. It would be good to see these, um, these guidelines in depth if you wouldn't mind sending them yep, or provide the that. link. That would be very helpful. Liam Kerr. Does the Glasgow Bar and the Law Society in their submissions and now Professor Leverick this morning uh, state a clear view that there wouldn't be any gaps in the law were we to repeal this Act? Uh, not all witnesses before this committee seem to agree with you, so confining yourself purely to the legality of this, so not the wider messaging or anything like that, how confident are you that there will be no gaps if this law is taken away? Uh, as stated in our evidence uh, to the bill, uh, in, back in 2011, we, we identified a number of standalone offences and also some statutory aggravations, which, uh, where we took the view that uh, th this would adequately cover uh, any, uh, any new standalone offence of offensive behaviour at regulated football matches. Uh, we also recognise that uh, the, the offences and the, the crimes, the common law crimes, the breach of the peace, section 38 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2010, uh, we, we recognise that those, those would apply across the board uh, and perhaps one issue that's been taken uh, w with the legislation or continues to be taken with the legislation is that it is a special capacity offence in that it can only take place at a regulated football match, which is a, has a definition which I can perhaps come on to later. And I, I, I accept that uh, a view has been taken abroad that, that that is a concern, that that is targeting uh, those who are attending football matches. But uh, we were certainly of the view that uh, a, a number of both common law, the common law crime of breach of the peace, section 38, and a number of statutory aggravations are and continue to be in place, and uh, the, the behaviour at football matches, uh, offensive behaviour at football matches, could, could be dealt with uh, under existing legislation, Thank or pre-2012 pre legislation. I understand. I would just echo that. I'm, I'm very confident that 
behaviour that if, we, if the Act was repealed, there would be measures in place to, to cover the behaviour that's prosecuted under the Act. I think the only possible issue is one that was touched on briefly earlier, which is the extraterritorial mm -hmm. behaviour issue. Um, what probably wouldn't be covered is behaviour that takes place entirely outside Scotland. Um, the Act makes provision for that, and I think that's maybe the one gap that there would be. But whether that's an important gap is perhaps open for debate because we may be, you know, maybe we don't want to be prosecuting behaviour that takes place entirely outside Scotland. Maybe we want to leave that to the, the, national, the national courts of that jurisdiction. You, you kind of review, did you have any statistics of how often it had been used, in fact, outside Scotland? Oh, gosh. Um, I don't know is the answer to that. It's, okay. um, I think there's been at least one case where it has been used. But I think, I, I know that, I think, only because I've read the evidence that was given by, um, I think it was the representative from Crown Office earlier. I, I, I have no personal knowledge of that. Right, that would be good. If I may interject, can you know, I, I, like Professor Leverick, unfortunately I have no information as to its use uh, extraterritorially, but uh, it's uh, reflected in our uh, written submission, or certainly what uh, was provided to all MSPs in advance of the debate, uh, which took place in the Scottish Parliament on the 2nd of November of last year, and there's a reference made to the Lord Advocates Guideline uh, on the extraterritorial application, and uh, he states that, uh, if, if I may, given the practical and logistical difficulties of investigating and prosecuting a crime that occurred outside Scotland, a careful and measured approach must be taken, and the authorities in the place where the offence occurred should ordinarily have primary jurisdiction. I think that's, that's as it should be. Uh, that uh, there would be that deference to the, uh, the jurisdiction where the offence was alleged to have taken place. But that, um, Liam Kerr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Zelo. You didn't want to say anything on that point, didn't you? Just to see the Glasgow Bar Association believe that, just like the professor, and the, Mr. McGree, that, that there would be no gap in the law, and I accept what I think. But I think maybe, Mr. Kerr, you're referring to maybe the evidence from the 3rd of October from the Crown Office representative and Chief Assistant Constable Higgins. And I think as well, if I can point to their evidence, I think on page 10, they even say that if the 2012 Act would be repealed, we would still challenge behaviour under existing legislation and still arrest people for it. So there is existing, by their own admission, there is existing legislation there. The only issue, I think it's what the Professor said, is the extra territorial issue. I think there was a Berwick Rangers match with Rangers fans. I think that is the issue that was touched upon within the Crown's own written submissions. But I think as well that I think that issue only covers and encompasses Section 6, really. And I think that is the issue there. But then that goes back to where we were at the beginning with regards to the previous panel and regards to the implementation and use of Section 6, which is, isn't widespread to use it in any event. If I might press you on the Section 6, because the Scottish Government mm. uh, are of the view that the Section 6 offence specifically addresses threats intended to stir up religious hatred and that there isn't any other legislation to cover that specific uh, mischief. Uh, do you have any views on the government's position on that? With regards to the religious hatred? Sure. At this stage, I would maybe take some consideration with regards to more formal written submissions on it, but with regards to Section 6, the issue with that as well, I think, because it's the wording of Section 2 of the Act, which I think which, which allows prosecutors and, and initially the police service of Scotland to arrest people for the commission of offences, that the issue is that it, the wording says that to carry out a seriously violent act, I think that's causing concern with the Police Service of Scotland, and that needs addressed before we can take on the issue of whether there is any legislation there to protect certain offences, because what then is defined, that it's not defined as I understand it, is what's seriously violent. Mm -hmm. And I think that is why the Police Service of Scotland are trying to use the Section 127 offence, which I know the committee has heard about before, and I think if that offence is going to be the offence that is primarily used by the Police Service Scotland and the Crown Office, then clearly, surely, in our submission, that the Crown should be uh, instigating that they would wish greater sentencing powers for that section, because I know they've told the committee that it's limited to 12 months rather than the five years that Section 6 has already got. But I don't think I could really comment on the extent of the religious hatred, because I think the issue before we get on to that is the wording in Section 2. But do you concede then that the Scottish Government's position appears to be that if, if you were to remove Section 6 through repeal, there would be nothing underlying that, or there would be no other uh, act or mischief in place that could be 
attacked. Yeah, Professor Leverett. I, I don't think that would leave a gap because if somebody um, behaves in a threatening manner or makes a threat, that would be covered either by Section 38 of the Criminal mm. Justice and Licensing Scotland Act, threatening and abusive behaviour, <coughs> or if it's online, it could be covered by the Communications Act um, 2003, Section 127, and you could record the fact that it's um, religiously motivated or has a religious aggravation using the sentencing aggravation provision, so I, I don't think there's a gap. Right. Uh, just one final question, uh, again to Mr Zielo, if I may, Do, reflecting back to your comments right at the start, uh, and you'll forgive it's a slightly leading question, but uh, you talked about Section 6. Are you suggesting that as drafted, Section 6 is not fit for purpose, uh, and that is the reason for its lack of use thus far? I, I touched upon at the start, primarily using the, the words themselves but by the Police Service of Scotland in their own submission to this committee and their written, their written submissions. The Police Service of Scotland say in their own words that uh, due to the narrow scope, this has not been widely used by police. This section is not in that football context. The next paragraph in their written submission goes on to say that due to the wording of Section 6 of the Act, the majority of this cannot be dealt with using this provision and is in fact dealt with as an offence under the Communications Act, Section 127. So there is clearly a problem. It was highlighted, as I understand it, back through various committees, various submissions to the, this committee and other committees back in 2011 with regards to the specific wording of the Act. So it's not for me to say whether or not it, it, it is badly drafted or not, but we can infer if, if the Police Service of Scotland are advising this committee, in their own words, that due to the wording of the Act, an inference may be drawn that there's an issue with the drafting of the Act. Thank you. Uh, Liam MacArthur and then Ben McPherson. Uh, convener, uh, good morning. We heard uh, from the previous panel um, that uh, there seemed to be a, a, a general belief that the, the act in itself had not had an effect, a discernible effect, uh, in relation to behaviour at, uh, at football grounds, um, but that there was a serious concern about repeal sending an unhelpful message. Um, given what you've all said about the absence <coughs> of any gap uh, were repealed to take place, is there a is there a risk that those with protected characteristics, the, the groups we heard from in the previous panel, um, feel they are protected um, by a law in a way that that protection, in effect, isn't real, is, is more um, uh, sort of presentational and superficial than, than they imagine? Are there, are there inherent risks in having a, 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 a law that effectively gives people um, false comfort that they have protection under it? I think there may be, there maybe is a risk, because listening to the speakers that we had earlier, they, at least some of them clearly feel that the Act gives them protection that they don't otherwise have, even if actually that perception is, is, not, is not correct. Um, so I think there is a risk of that. Um, but I think what I would say about that is um, that's an area where actually we probably should be thinking about um, Lord Brackadale's hate crime review um, because, of course, in, in, in this act, the, the only protection that they actually have is in relation to a regulated football match, um, whereas actually I'm sure what people would want is to be protected more generally against hate crime. Um, so I think that there's something to be said here for putting the hate crime bit on pause and waiting to see what Lord Brackadale in, comes in up with. In that respect, I mean, very often um, a, a number of committees, um, one hears that over time the constant amendment of legislation leads to its own complexities and that there are sort of clamours for, for, uh, uh, for uh, legislation that pulls all of that together. Is there a risk in holding on uh, to the current legislation and trying to amend it to expand its provisions or, 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 its, or its reach? That in a sense, we, we, we build in that complexity rather than um, clear the, the slate in relation to this legislation that pretty much all those, whether arguing for repeal or not, have admitted um, is, is uh, defective in, in, in certain aspects um, and allow Lord Brackadale's recommendations then to be taken forward, um, taking into consideration the full gamut of hate crime that we all uh, clearly wish to see um, dealt with. And the one thing I would say about that is um, yes, 
but not everything in the act that we're looking at today is a hate crime provision. Mm. Um, a lot of it is, is related to hate crime, but the, 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 the various different parts of the act, not all of them are hate crime related. Some of them are just straightforward public order mm -hmm. offences that have no connection to hate crime whatsoever. Um, at least part of the section six um, criminal offence, again, is not a hate crime related provision. So we, although I did say, you know, hang on, wait and see what Lord Brackerdale says. That, 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 that's only going to take you so far because there are parts of the Act that don't relate to hate crime at all. No other views? Uh, just just the, the, the balance, I mean, there's obviously a view taken that uh, by, by repeal that, that can send out the, the wrong message. Uh, I would contend that, that that would really have to be balanced against, as Professor Leverick uh, has alluded to, the, the fact that uh, this is not just a piece of hate crime legislation, albeit that it's a subject to, its scope is subject to, to uh, Lord Brackadale's review, but uh, I, I, I would guess that that really would have to be uh, weighed up uh, against uh, the, the content of the 2012 Act and also its, uh, how, how it's working at present, how the courts interpret it and uh, how it can be enforced. Okay, thank you. Um, supplementary, Ben, Ben Fulton and Mary. Uh, sorry, Mary. Thank you, Convener. Just very briefly, as um, you covered some of the points in response to Liam Kerr around uh, advantages that the Crown and Procurement Fiscal Service have stated in terms of Section 6, um, police officers, the, the, the Police Scotland have also suggested to us that the Act, as, as it is, is another useful tool to them when policing football matches in, in or around football matches on top of the common law breach of the peace and uh, Section 38, the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act 2010. I just wondered if you could, you could comment on that point because I think it's, it's, an, it's an important position that Police Scotland have, have put forward to us, it particularly Professor and, and, and can't Alan really Kudian. speak for Please. Police Scotland. I mean, all I, I would say is, as, as we have pointed out, they, they did also say in their evidence that if the Act was taken away, nothing would really change. They would simply um, use other provisions of the of the law. Um, it may it may be that it's an important tool in communicating that certain types of behaviour are unacceptable albeit that they are covered by other parts of the law. Um, but that's not really my area of expertise. Uh, I must confess, there's not much I can usefully uh, add uh, in regard to, or with regard rather to section six. Uh, unlike section one, it is not a special capacity hmm. offence, hmm. so it does apply uh, across the board. And I, I, I obviously take on board what uh, Police Scotland say with it being another useful tool in the armory. Uh, in dealing with uh, what, what seems to be online abuse. Uh, but uh, as, as previously stated, uh, society would very much take the view that uh, there are existing provisions in place. And it is worthy of some note uh, that uh, I think it was last year, there was, I think it was 51. Okay. I think it's fair to say there's been a low number uh, for, for reasons that I, I, I must say I'm unaware of, but it does seem that there has been a relatively low number of prosecutions under Section 6 of the 2012 Act. I, I guess, um, just, just from an objective perspective, I, I was curious whether from a theoretical position you saw value in what the police have said that this is a useful tool. Um, and I know that's quite a conceptual question, but mm -hmm. given that you're a professor of, of criminal law, I thought it might be an interesting one to, 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 to touch on, but I appreciate what you've, I, I, what you've said already. I, would, I don't know what reason they gave for why they saw value in it, given that it, the behaviour would be covered by other criminal law provisions. It would, be, it would be fair to say that uh, Section 6 allows for prosecution and indictment, mm. and uh, the, the one offence which we've referred to, or one of the offences which we've referred to in our written submission, is the, as, as, uh, as Mr Ziolo referred to earlier, the Section 127 offence of uh, improper use of a public and electronic communications network, and that can only be tried summarily, uh, whereas uh, what you have in Section 6 is, is the ability to prosecute on indictment if it's so serious. Indeed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Fulton and Mary. Um, my uh, question is actually following on from Liam MacArthur's, but it's a slightly different uh, <coughs> twist on it, if you like, and it's more in terms of accessibility. And I'd just like to start by um, welcoming the SFA and the SPFL's 
commitment to looking at accessibility through a more recently established cross-party group. Um, one of the themes that's ran through that all the panellists here have said is about football fans feeling singled out. Um, but the reverse of that is some of the strong evidence, as Liam MacArthur uh, touched on, that we've heard from uh, Stonewall Scotland, Scottish Women's Convention, Scottish Disability Sports Association, amongst others, that actually this law is making them feel safer, their members feel safer about going uh, to football games. So I suppose my question is, is there any concern uh, that if the, if the act is repealed, then actually, in a way, we've made the game less accessible to these protected groups, given the evidence that they are suggesting? I just want to know your views on that. I think perception is not reality, and I think it's important for the hate crime review to actually consider some of the softer issues as well as um, some of the gaps, perhaps, that have been identified um, as a result of th these evidence uh, sessions. None of us would want to get to a position where fans f don't feel safe. Um, but clearly, if part of this act is not being used, um, if the police themselves are challenging um, th the ability for it to, uh, to be implemented, then I think you know, it does need addressing. So I believe that perhaps the way to deal with that is to let the hate crime review play out and let's see what comes of that and then decide whether or not um, the act can be repealed. Well, actually, that, that's a really interesting answer because that was going to be my uh, further question, convener. It was in relation to the Bracadale uh, review, so you've answered that as well, thanks. Is there anybody else want to comment? Oh, okay. Manny? Well, was exactly following on from Fulton's point there. It was about the Lord Brackadale review because I understand, yeah, a few of you have expressed your opinions on that as well. I'd just be looking for uh, Desmond and Neil if you had an opinion on that as well and whether or not we should wait until the result of the, the Brackadale review comes through. I think I'd be loath to offer any uh, advice in terms of timing to people who understand the criminal law a, be a lot better than I do. And certainly we will continue to engage with Lord Brackadale. We've met with him once already. I will continue to engage with him and to, to do what we can to support his work. Okay. I don't think that we should wait for the Bracadie re review. I understand from the other faith groups this morning that they feel that the hate crime legislation, etc., would be better and beneficial for the assessment to be carried out under that umbrella. But I think it should be looked at succinctly with two separate entities, this bill and Lord Bracadie, just because uh, the Glasgow Bar Association and other members come before the committee and say that we wish this door submit that this act should be repealed doesn't mean to say that we don't support any other acts of, or statutory instruments that the government wants to lay forward if it relates to hate crime under Lord Brackadale's review. I think there's two separate, ends, two separate entities that should be looked at. I would agree with your point. I think they are two separate entities in a way, but I still think that this is still going to be impacted by that review. It, to me, it would make sense that once we have the results of, the, of that review, that would be the time to, to consider it, since that will play a part in it. I accept your proposition, and, and many other uh, panel members have come before this meeting and said the same thing. I accept that, but I, I still think that when you're looking at it from a legal perspective with regards to what is actually happening within the sheriff courts uh, around Scotland with regards to Section 1 and the contentious issues that have gone on for the last six years, or sorry, five years in relation to this Act, and the lack of use of Section 6, I, I, I still go back to where we were at the beginning that there, there is no gap in the existing legislation that protects people. And as the professor has already correctly and succinctly narrated, there are the aggravations that are there. The presiding sheriffs at first instance cases uh, can sentence uh, accused persons if they're found guilty or plead guilty to offences under Section 38.1 or breach of the peace with a racial aggravation or a sectarian aggravation uh, and sentence them uh, along with the, the, the substantive offence and it is recorded as, uh, in their criminal convictions as a breach of the peace, Section 38, with the specific aggravator. So hate crime is being prosecuted. And, and if, I think, I think what uh, one of the gentlemen, Mr McPherson, maybe point was making there, and I'm sorry to diverse, but, but with, regards to, with regards to where uh, persons uh, feeling as if they, they can't go to the football, legislation is already there through common law powers and legislation to... to protect persons going to football and it is a shame that some people might feel that they can't go to football for a variety of reasons because they think that this act uh, if it's repealed would stop them going and there would be no protection but there is protection under the existing legislation that maybe then that, that is maybe an issue that these organisations and groups would have with the Police Service of Scotland. 
as to why they are not maybe implementing those charges and making the public feel safer by going for these specific groups. Thank you. Thank you, Camina. Um, good morning, panel. Can I address this to Mr. McCready, please? Um, uh, Mr. McCready, could you elaborate on the Law Society's written evidence, which suggests that the confusion has uh, confusion has arisen uh, with regard to what is considered offensive and or unacceptable uh, behaviour with regard to Section One? Yes, of course. Happy to do so. I think the Society has taken a uh, particular issue with uh, Section One Two E of the mm -hmm. Act, uh, in that. Uh, it uh, defines behaviour uh, among the, uh, the references given at uh, A to D. Uh, e defines behaviour uh, as other behaviour that a reasonable person would be likely to consider offensive. And uh, there is, in terms of the Act itself, that there is no definition. And, and the, the courts have uh, expressed, as I understand, expressed some concern around the, the lack of definition of what behaviour in, in terms of 1 to E would constitute offensive behaviour for the purposes of this offence at, uh, at Section 1. There seems to have been put in place, it's my reading of the Act, that there seems to have been put in place a safeguard uh, at 1-5 uh, uh, in that, uh, sorry, no, one, I do beg your pardon, uh, the safeguard is, is, is either uh, it, it will uh, be incited to uh, public disorder or would uh, persons would likely to be incited to public disorder. Uh, and I think that, I come back to 1.5, it, it may, may be something of an issue because, because one might have uh, an offence in the abstract, mm -hmm. uh, is that uh, the, the offensive behaviour took place, but what must be disregarded is the fact that measures are there, uh, such as segregation at a football match, at a football stadium, or that uh, the people who would be likely to be, excited, to, to be incited to public disorder are not present, so there's just simply nobody there to be offended. Uh, by the, the behaviour. I appreciate the behaviour uh, or offensive behaviour is, is set out at 1-2, but I think particular reference has to be made to 1-2-E, uh, which seems to be something of a catch-all, where it's other behaviour that a reasonable mm. person would be likely to consider offensive. So you'd like to see some clarity? There, 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 there could be some clarity. Uh, might I add that, uh, standing whether the, 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 uh, the Act is repealed or otherwise, there is provision at Section 5 mm -hmm. of the Act mm -hmm. uh, for Scottish ministers, so that, that's a fix that wouldn't, wouldn't, necessar wouldn't need uh, primary legislation. But at Section 5 of the Act, uh, there's power for Scottish ministers to amend both Sections 1 and 4 by, by order. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, I have a couple of questions for Mr. Reagan and Mr. Um, Doncaster. I wonder if you could both um, <coughs> give us some detail about how the relationships between supporters and clubs has changed since the introduction of the Act. Um, <clears throat> clearly, that I think you'd get a much um, uh, more detailed answer if you spoke directly to the clubs, and perhaps you know the clubs themselves would be delighted to welcome. Um, to welcome any member of the committee to visit and see the, the work that they do. Um, I believe that the relationship um, through the introduction of the SLO, the Supporter Liaison Officer, has, has um, improved the working relationship and that has provided, as I said earlier, a bridge between the club and the supporters groups. Um, key topics are discussed, you know, particularly uh, topics which are of concern to supporters and that doesn't just cover unacceptable conduct but that covers a, a whole ra range of issues so I think fans have certainly got more of a voice um, the relationship that we ourselves have developed with supporters direct Scotland has actually allowed us to carry out things like the national football survey for example um, and to also provide an opportunity to hear back from the, the supporters' organisation. So, uh, yes, I think there, there has been an improvement in that relationship over time. Okay. Mr Doncaster? I, I, echo that. I think the, uh, the relationship between clubs generally and supporters direct Scotland, uh, uh, sorry, between clubs and supporter groups is a very positive one and, and improving, and that's largely due to the excellent work that supporters direct Scotland are, are carrying out. Um, I think there's no doubt that as a result of the Act, some uh, fans groups feel demonised, uh, but I don't think that really uh, that, that doesn't really uh, go towards the relationship between them and their club. I think the relationship between supporters and their clubs remains extremely strong, uh, but I do feel that they, the effect of the Act is that uh, a number of fans do feel demonised. Okay. Um, 
would you say that there is still a problem with offensive behaviour at football? Has that lessened any since the introduction of the Act? I think um, we, with the work that I talked about earlier, mm. are monitoring all aspects of unacceptable conduct, and clearly that does include uh, acts that are, that are criminal within the law. Um, so we look at the, uh, all of the unacceptable conduct that takes place across all of the uh, games, the 42 clubs within the SPFL, um, and we monitor that very carefully through the delegates, particularly at the, the top end. So we are doing that monitoring at present. Uh, we are sharing the results with government, and uh, we'll continue to do that. Okay, Mr. Regan, do you have a view? Um, I, I think certainly um, the, the Act, that there are examples where the Act is being used. Um, I read in the National Policing Strategy for Scotland that's just been published that 52% of the, um, the cases where the Act was used came from three football matches in the last 12 months. Um, so there are examples where the Act has been used. The question, I think, is are football fans being unfairly singled out? And, you know, secondly, does other existing legislation provide cover for dealing with unacceptable conduct? And I think we've heard from a number of experts in this field, much more so than, than myself, that, you know, there is provision elsewhere. And therefore, as long as there are no gaps, which is where the hate crime review could come in, you know, then there, there may be an opportunity for, for the, the, the committee to, to consider the next step. So would you say then that... Um football fans are unfairly singled out? I think certainly when you um, look at the survey, and as I said earlier, 71% of 13,000 people believe that the Act is, is not working, and the consultation that we've had suggests that fan, fans do feel demonised, as Neil said earlier. They do feel that they are being singled out because of um, this being the national sport. There is no other legislation that focuses on a single sport there is no other legislation that focuses on other societal areas, arts and culture, music, for example. The, the, the law generally picks up um, uh, everything else. Okay. Before you leave that, can I just ask, and I notice from your written submission you make reference to the private members' bill being proposed on strict liability, as well as the, the Bracken deal report, and, and you say that that's only served to add to the confusion among supporters and to heighten anxiety that they are unfairly discriminated against. Could you maybe elaborate a little bit on that? Just that um, I think <coughs> the whole topic of behaviour has been focused on in lots of different areas. Um, and we're all of the mind and were of the mind back in 2011 that we didn't want to see behaviour worsen and we wanted to do something to address it, which is why at the time we were very supportive of the direction of travel of this particular bill. But over time, um, the topic of strict liability has been thrown into the pool and has added um, or, or created a little bit of confusion. Many people don't fully understand the term strict, li strict liability and what it means. Um, and you know, secondly, the Brackadale Review of Hate Crime, which does tiptoe into the area of um, uh, football-related unacceptable conduct. So you've got three key areas, all of which are focused in some way on football, and you can imagine the reaction of the football fan, which is, you know, why is this about football? You know, why can't just society and unacceptable conduct be addressed by standard legislation? Mm -hmm. And I suppose really part of this, um, this argument is that the clubs are already, as you've said today and outlined very clearly, doing a lot with supporters to improve behaviour and working on their various activities going on. So perhaps there isn't an equal discussion on, on that aspect of it. Maybe. Thank you. I've got one um, very brief follow-up question and then I'll move on to my question yeah. to Professor Leverick. Um, we've talked a lot in these evidence sessions about the importance of, of education and how education is key to tackling some of the behaviours um, around football. And both of you will be aware of the Equality Network Sports Charter that a number of professional clubs have signed up to, and that's to promote um, inclusion across the LGBTI um, community. And, and it has had a, a varying range of successes, and it's got a trickle-down effect because it works with young people in the clubs as supporters, and, and it changes the whole ethos um, in the club. Do you see something similar to that having a really beneficial effect in tackling sectarianism and offensive behaviour? 
Shall I go first? I mean, we, we are proud to be signatories to that charter. We, we think it's a very positive step. Uh, we know that a number of our uh, member clubs have, have done the same. Um, I do believe that the clubs generally carry out a huge amount of very positive work in the, their communities. And I talked earlier about uh, Follow With Pride and, and Boys Against Bigotry, which are just two examples of the work that uh, clubs are carrying out in this area to educate and improve society. Okay, thank you, Mr. Yeah, the Scottish FA um, have recently appointed an Equality and Diversity uh, Manager. Uh, we've been nominated for a Scottish Diversity Award recently, and we've been held up by FIFA for best practice in the area of equality and diversity. So we've also signed up to the Charter. We're doing some uh, fantastic work in the, the area of LGBT um, with para football, um, you know, with um, the, the, the girls and women's game and so on and so forth. So we are very proactive in this area. Um, as far as behaviour, uh, unacceptable behaviour is concerned, I mentioned earlier the relationship we, we, we have with the clubs, but also with the likes of Shaw Racism, the red card. We also are big supporters of Positive Coaching Scotland, which um, is an in initiative that's been driven through the Winning Scotland Foundation, and it's now been embedded into our coach education programmes. So we're trying to start at the grassroots level in reinforcing the right behaviours at the outset, and that, that permeating through grassroots as children um, get, get older. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Professor Leverett, can I, I move on to... Um, you for a moment. Can, can you perhaps give us some detail um, around approaches taken in other jurisdictions in, in relation to um, sectarian and offensive behaviour? Um, I, I know you spoke about what goes on in England and Wales, but in, in the wider sense, is there, other, is there any other country that has the same specific legislation that targets one specific group of people? And if so, what impact has that had? Um, yes, I'm happy to answer that. The simple answer to the question is no. There isn't, as far as we can tell, I don't, I don't want to give a definitive no because our, our, our review focused mainly on materials in the English language. I, I wouldn't want to absolutely promise, you know, there's not something out there in, in, in Serbian or something that we, we've missed, but um, our review showed that there isn't anything that specifically targets football supporters in this way that we could find at all. Probably the closest thing to it, I've already mentioned the English legislation. The, apart from that, the closest thing to it is that in, in Northern Ireland, um, there is the Justice Act, Northern Ireland 2011, and that prohibits um, various types of chanting at sporting fixtures, um, of which sectarian chanting is, is one of the things that it prohibits, along with, I think, um, gosh, various other types of chanting, <coughs> racist chanting um, and other types of offensive chanting. It doesn't confine that to football, though. Um, it covers football and, I think, rugby union, I think Gaelic games as well. Um, so it's not specifically football-focused. Um, aside from that, we really couldn't find anything else worldwide that is as narrowly focused as, as the Act in, in Scotland. You, you do have legislation worldwide that targets either kind of sporting events generally or large public events generally and has kind of public order or hate crime offences around that, but certainly nothing that targets football specifically, okay. aside and from the English legislation. And are you aware if... Um, there have been any difficulties in implementing the, the legislation in England because you know there has been confusion around, around the, the legislation here. Is there anything similar in England? I don't think so. The, the legislation in England is much, much more straightforward. It's very narrowly targeted at chanting at football matches mm. and racist chanting or what they term indecent chanting. Um, so it's got a much narrower focus than, than the Scottish legislation has. It also has a much lower maximum penalty. Um, from memory, I think it, you can't be imprisoned for breaching the English legislation. I think the maximum penalty is a, a fine. Um, but what the English le legislation doesn't have is a link to public disorder. So it, it, it just prohibits racist and indecent chanting. No, no, no add-ons. Um, it's, so in that sense it's much, much narrower than the Scottish legislation. As far as I can tell from my review, um, there haven't been any problems in implementing that. It seems to have been successful in cutting out racist 
chanting, although that might have happened anyway. It's hard to, to pin it to the act. Um, it probably hasn't been that successful in cutting out indecent chanting. I think a lot of that still goes on in English football grounds, um, but certainly the racist chanting is pretty much gone now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Sorry? Thank you, Convener. Um, panel members, um, currently sectarianism is not defined within Scots law, if you probably know. Is it a barrier to tackling what is perceived to be sectarian behaviour? Maybe Mr. Creedy could kick that one off. Mr. Creedy, could you like to kick that off? Uh, sectarianism, is, you're quite correct, is not defined, and I suspect that that uh, may cause some, some, some issues as to how to uh, specifically uh, criminalise the offence of sectarianism. Uh, it's always, it's been my understanding that it's, uh, it's, it's incitement to hatred of a a religious group uh, for whatever reason uh, and I know that's something that's actually uh, in uh, section 1-2 of the act uh, or, or, or it doesn't have to be a religious group, a social or cultural group with a perceived religious affiliation but uh, that, that is certainly to define sectarianism uh, I, I suspect would, would indeed be problematic. Yeah, okay. yeah. Professor? I don't really have anything to, to add to that. I, I don't think, I don't think, I mean, the, the Act doesn't specifically refer to sectarianism at all. It's not part of the terms of the Act, but the Act has still been used to tackle what most people would perceive as sectarian chanting and sectarian songs. So I think the fact that sectarian, sectarianism not only isn't defined, but isn't even in the Act, hasn't stopped it from being used to prosecute what most people would regard as sectarian conduct. Memorandum, it's to tackle sectarianism, but he's mentioned that. It's true, that. but it, it's not, it, the Act itself behavior is. doesn't yeah. use the term sectarian Absolutely. at all. Yeah. Um, no, I, I accept it, that was the purpose of the Act, yeah. but I think that maybe answers the question that, you know, it, despite sectarianism not being defined or even being part of the text of the Act, it has nonetheless been used to tackle sectarian behaviour. adds behavior. to the confusion. Yeah. 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 Mrs Euler, can I... I think... It, on, I don't really have a view on behalf of the association as to whether or not there should be a definition. I, I note the Police Service of Scotland noted one of the additional difficulties in their submissions to this committee was that there was no clear definition, but over the 10, 15, 20 years there have been definitions by the court or case, cases that have gone before the courts and the appellate courts with regards to certain uh, words, banners, offences that have been classified as sectarian and, and clearly there's a case law body already existing there and again the existing legislation and common law powers can, can uh, be used to prosecute certain offences and diagnose them as sectarian. Okay, thank you. Can I ask supplementary to, uh, to Mr. Reagan yes, and Mr. Donkers? Yeah. Right, uh, uh, Mr. Reagan, Mr. Donkers, you can ask, answer this question. One of the issues that has arisen uh, in evidence is when a large number of fans engage in offensive behaviour, which, given the disparity of numbers between the police and fans, these cannot be tackled at that time. Um, how are the SFA and SPRF, SPFL ensuring that clubs uh, take action as appropriate? First, um, we actually amended our rules in the summer and the amendment uh, put a specific obligation on clubs, which is referred to in the guidelines, which I will, of course, share with members, um, the, the specific requirement on clubs <coughs> to deal with unacceptable conduct after it has occurred. So we accept that in the moment uh, where there may be public order reasons why uh, behaviour cannot be tackled at that time, nonetheless, it should be tackled appropriately after the event and uh, appropriate efforts being be made to identify people who are responsible and, and to take them to task accordingly. And you're working with the clubs to do that? Absolutely. Yeah. Mr Reid? Yeah, I've got nothing to add really other than to say the Scottish FA rules mirror those of the SPFL and the members are the same members and therefore we deal with um, those clubs in exactly the same way. If something happens, then after the event, clubs are expected to take action to identify perpetrators, use CCTV, um, remove season tickets if necessary and so on and so forth. We work and you follow clubs. up on that, do you? Yes. Right. Go. Liam Kerr. Very briefly, just for clarity, that presumably only applies where the behaviour takes place within the, the confines of the ground. Uh, that wouldn't apply outside the ground where, as I understand it, a lot of the behaviour takes place. Correct. And from our point of view, we're a members' organisation and we govern our members and clearly they are responsible for what happens within their ground. Uh, what happens elsewhere is clearly a police matter and, and that's out with our jurisdiction. Thank you. 
That concludes the committee's questions. Claire, do you, do you have any questions you want to put to the panel? Um, thank you, convener. Just a, a brief question. Uh, looking at the Law Society uh, briefing for today, there was a couple <coughs> of points under um, 3 and Section 4 where you talk about um, if the Act is not repealed, we would like to see more cases in the appeals courts. I think that's referred to a, a couple of times. Um, because of recognition that they need to clarify the Act and the reach of the Act. I don't know if you want to maybe expand a wee bit so, more so on yes, of course. That yeah, I suspect that, that perhaps goes to uh, the point I made earlier around interpretation, uh, particularly Section 1, and I, I mentioned earlier uh, the catch-all provision that's 1, 2, E, uh, may be subject to further you know, judicial interpretation, other behaviour that a, a reasonable person would be likely to consider offensive. A point the society made at bill stage back in 2011 and continued to make was also the, the, the very wide, and because it's a threefold offence, uh, the behaviour has to take place. Uh, it's either likely to incite public disorder or, as I'd said, the, the, the abstract of would be likely to incite public disorder, but, but for the fact that no one's there, uh, and also that it has to take place in relation to a regulated football match. Uh, comments uh, have been uh, made by the Society on the, the definition of uh, regulated football match and that this is where it becomes very much a special capacity offence because it has to take place in relation to a regulated football match and uh, th th that's defined, it gives you the section 55.2 uh, definition of the Police Public Order and Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2006 and I appreciate that there hasn't, or as I understand, I'll qualify that, that there hasn't been any uh, judicial interpretation uh, on a uh, regulated football match. But, but for instance, that, that would not, as I understand, that, that, that would not cover, uh, for instance, the Scottish Junior Football Association. That wouldn't cover their games, which take place in Scotland. It, it would not cover uh, a football match between two foreign countries that, that was taking, or, or clubs from foreign countries, such as, I mean, obviously, Hamden Park has held the, the European Cup final, Champions League final. Uh, UEFA Cup finals, it wouldn't cover th those types of matches. Uh, and also the, the point the society has made before about uh, the, the journey to and from the game, uh, or the match rather, or regulated football match, which hasn't, uh, as I understand, been subject of any uh, interpretation because Section 2.2 is very, very, very widely drawn. Uh, and concern has also been expressed around televised football matches. Uh, there's no indication as to whether a football match has to be a, a live football match, uh, whether or not uh, it, it can be recorded highlights of a football match, uh, or a regulated football match rather, uh, or whether or not it has to be, uh, it talks about uh, being anywhere, anywhere, in any place other than domestic premises. Uh, it talks about television, uh, and since 2012 of course we've got more and more people using mobile telephones uh, to watch football matches, or iPads or tablets. Uh, and the like, and, and th these, are, th these are issues uh, which uh, I would contend uh, haven't been, perhaps because the, the, the case law just hasn't been built up, but these are certainly difficulties w with the Act uh, as, as, uh, as drafted at present that uh, the courts may have such some issue in, in, in interpretation. So what I suppose, um, so, yeah. well, how would you describe what that means for people who are being prosecuted or pursued through the Act, and what does it mean for people who are there to represent them in terms of trying I, I think, to... I think society will always strive for, you know, in terms of law reform, always striving for clarity and certainty mm -hmm. uh, in, in the law. Uh, what one could conceivably have a situation where, if it's not, and I appreciate the, and I certainly don't seek to minimise the issues that have been referred to by previous speakers around uh, offensive behaviour within football stadia in, in, in Scotland, but, but one could have an example of uh, someone in a pub uh, watching a series of football matches on a, on a Sunday and one, one match may be a, an English Premiership match between, for instance, it was the Man City Arsenal game at the weekend. So that's clearly not a regulated football match for the purposes of this legislation, uh, wh whereas uh, another match that may be shown or watched in the same pub on the same day, uh, which, which involves two Scottish clubs, the other game on Sunday, I guess, would have been the, the hearts Kilmarnock game at, uh, at uh, Murrayfield. So clearly that is... Uh, that, that is a regulated football match. So the offence can take place when people are in a pub watching one game, but, but not another. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. It just occurs to me before we finish, it would be good to get a, a view from the panel uh, members. And the SFA um, submission, there were concerns about of enforceability before the legislation was introduced. 
these um, are still to the fore, the same concerns after the legislation has been introduced. The Glasgow Bar Association, again, goes back to the definition of the Act failing to properly define the behaviour element of the offence. So can I ask you generally, do you think the Act has been effective in deterring offensive behaviour per se? It's difficult to say. I think the statistics will speak for themselves whether the, the crime statistics, but I note the statistics that have been proffered by the Crown and, and the Police Service of Scotland don't relate to the 2012 Act. That the, I note from the minutes that there wasn't, they were not providing, providing the, the committee with other offences, as common law breach of the police offences, Section 38, which has been used widely, mm -hmm. um, which is unfortunate because I think we're only really okay. assessing the 2012 Act, but I think you have to look at the broader picture with regards to the other offences out with the stadia, out with uh, what other offences have been charged within the stadia? Was it just the 2012 Act? I know it's another tool, but if police officers are interchanging the offence, it would be good to know um, those offences so we can take a broader view of all the figures. So it might be in the breach of the peace of Gondown they've used the Act instead? It, it, it could have been, or there could be a number of breach of the peace charges, Section 38 offences, with the, the various aggravations that we don't know about to compare and, compare and contrast from previous years, and that might be something the committee may wish to, to analyse over, uh, uh, just a suggestion, I don't know if it's <laughs> you want to do that or not, but it would make it more sense that if we have all the figures, then we can say it has gone down, it has gone up. But yes, clearly, the police officers are using this because the statistics are there. Mm -hmm. um, right. I think we need more information. Okay. Mr McCready. Sorry, I'm not sure if there's much I can usefully add to that, uh, other than that we, we do note that the figures that are being kept around uh, prosecutions, and uh, uh, I know that, I, th I think it was 377 uh, last year on, and I think uh, references have been made to uh, it being maybe uh, certainly one high-profile game uh, I can think of being the 2016 Scottish Cup final, but it may be that, uh, you know, concern uh, has, you know, has to be Around the the level of uh, the level of charges being profiled with regard to the 2012 Act, both Section One and uh, even more so Section Six, where I think it was 51 uh, offences uh, prosecuted under Section Six of the Act. Fiona, uh, Lara. Um, if, if the question is, has it been effective? I, I don't have any personal experience of that, but I I would point to the official evaluation of the acts that was undertaken by. Um, Neil Hamilton Smith and, and, and some other colleagues. I think people referred to that in a previous evidence session referred to that and the conclusion of that evaluation was that there certainly had been a reduction in um, offensive chanting in football grounds since the act has come into force, but it was simply impossible to tell whether it was because of the act. And that, that, that's a conundrum I don't think you're ever going to solve. It, it could, there's so many other factors that could have affected that, just changes in social attitudes, changing policing strategies and so on. So actually trying to attribute improvements to the yeah. Act is always going to be very, very difficult. OK, thank you. Mr Reagan. I don't have a view on, from a legal perspective on how effective the Act has been. What I would say is 71% of football fans don't think it's really been is. effective. And I also think that... You know, the relationships have been damaged between fans and the various stakeholders because of the act and the fact that football feels as if it's been singled out. And then on that basis, there are clearly issues there that need to be tackled. OK, and Mr Doncaster? Uh, nothing I can usefully add, Camina. And on that note, can I thank all the panellists very much for um, what has been an excellent evidence session. Thank you. We now move into private session. Uh, our next meeting will be on Tuesday 14th of November when we will continue our consideration of the offensive behaviour at football and civil litigation bill. <laughs>